and we're ready for session number two. Sorry for my voice. <laughs> but first of all, I want to shortly talk to our online audience. I know if you have like some technical issues, we will have a YouTube link in the description in the chat so you can switch there and the uh, quality will be a little bit increased. And now going back to session number two, the market session. And I won't say much because I think it's time to get a dream team on stage. So all of our live people already know them. <laughs> it's Philip, the data whisperer of IFCN, and Eric Elgersma. Please come up stage. There we go. Now, what a great opportunity to share things with you today. But I start with a message which you may perhaps not anticipate. IFCN is a very optimist organization, which is also why I cherish so much to cooperate with them. But today's message, the first 10, 12 slides, may not always, if you reflect on them, be optimistic. But we need to face the facts, and we need to, say, to see the data and base our story on the data. So we need to share them anyway. And we're privileged. We worked in earlier this year, thanks to uh, Lucas organizing it so well, we worked together with an think tank based in the Netherlands called HCSS, which is the, the Hague Center for Security Studies. And normally such a think tank works for the Ministry of Defense or the European Union or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But earlier this year, they worked with us to explore what would happen next in the world of energy. And some of their ideas, with their permission, we're sharing today with you, and I'm, as a chemical engineer, feeling relatively comfortable sharing energy data. So we'll be sharing them today with you, because we believe the broader context of what's happening in the world of energy will partly determine what will happen in the world of dairy. Right, Philip? That's fully correct, Eric. So yeah. please, what have we learned from them? What valuable insights they have been providing to us? Well, HCSS. First of all, of course, share it with us. We've been in a storm, but the last thing in this broad audience representing so many countries across the around the world is to realize that that storm was more Eurocentric than we were willing to admit. And I see you nodding, uh, Rajesh. So, first of all, we should be humble. In Europe, there's only 7% of the world, so 8% of the world's population. But that European population did indeed experience a strong effect, and the energy prices have been in a roller coaster like never before for geopolitical reasons, as we all know. So, then of course we look on and we see suddenly a geopolitical shift that we had not expected even 25 years ago. The US is now one of the world's leading sources of energy, especially fossil energy, fossil fuel-based energy. And that has enormous geopolitical consequences, with the US being much less dependent on the Arab world. Its foreign policy towards the Arab world has changed, and suddenly we see a reconciliation of Saudi Arabia and Iran under Chinese leadership. So just imagine what happens when interests shift because energy policies shift and energy-related interests shift. And the U.S., to some extent, again, came to the savior of their Western European allies by su supporting them with uh, liquefied natural gas in the last winter. So you saw that now suddenly the supply chains of energy have shifted, but if one country came out as a winner, it was the U.S., and what happened in energy 
in the broader context of dairy may well happen in food and dairy in particular, where the world normally used to be served by New Zealand and the European Union, this large range of countries around the equator, the net dairy importers, that role may well be taken over by the US. On the protein side, the US is already on the way. On the fat component side, it's still more or less self-sufficient and neutral. But the question is, will that remain? So what we see in energy and what happened in energy may come to dairy. And therefore, <clears throat> given the extraordinary experience of HCSS, we're actually now contemplating FCN and HCSS to take this a step forward and look for, say, parties for whom, and that could very well be a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that could very well be the EU or a similar party, to compare notes on the energy and the dairy side, look for the commonalities, look for the differences and advise policy options for food security, at the same time reconciled with green and environmental, uh, climate, etc. targets. So what's happening with this new energy order? We need to look for a new normal in Europe. The old supply chain is disrupted and there's no immediate evidence that was what used to be the rule of the game will be the game again. So we have a new setup for energy. And if you're a European dairy exporter, especially if you produce powders, and you produce those powders based on natural gas, your picture changes or has changed. And if you haven't noticed, then your accountant has hidden the books for you because it has changed and it is changing. And the question is therefore, will that transition be easy? And the answer is probably not. So what does that mean on farm when the processor incurs so much extra energy cost that the market can hard, that, that, that the milk price that processor can afford to pass on down in the, in the value chain will be poor. What does that mean for the business case for maintaining and expanding dairy in Europe? Because the uncertainty is structural. Europe is, dairy, is energy deficient. There's no one in the world believing that will change anytime soon. And we have to accommodate ourselves to it. There's another perspective, no matter how hard we work in dairy, in our wonderful industry, in combating CO2 emissions, if there's one thing we learn, it is that fossil fuels will be with us for the times to come. Because there's underinvestment in, say, expanding in renewable energy, and there's even underinvestment in fossil fuels. So the volatility of fossil fuel prices, as you can see in the diagram, first of all, the global energy demand has gone up with a factor of 10 in a century's time. But especially the forward projections show you that fossil fuels, also in the next decade or two, will at least be the remaining source of energy in the world. So we may all enjoy the new windmills and, and maybe here and there nuclear power will expand, maybe we'll see more solar. But the reality is that may affect the energy mix to produce electricity, but it hasn't solved the entire world's picture. Because the entire world's picture will be one where fossil fuels, no matter what happens to the climate, will be the only way forward unless we all step, say, on a global scale back in our energy need and that is also not a likely scenario. What that means is that our friends at uh, HCSS provided us with this picture, and this picture shows you an enormous range of different scenarios, each of which estimates the percentage that fossil fuel makes up of the total global energy demand by 2050. First of all, it shows the power of scenarios. If you have different assumptions, you may have different outcomes. And if anyone builds scenarios, it's uh, yourself, Philip. So we're very curious to see your 2030 scenario coming up in a minute. But you see these scenarios, and these scenarios tell you 
that if you take slightly different assumptions, the outcomes may be very different because it's anywhere between 85% and 15% if you choose different out, um, assumptions. However, if you would say, is there something like a consensus opinion on what it will be, it's probably 50% still by 2050. And we're under-investing, as I said. We're under-investing globally. I promise you it wouldn't be an optimistic story, but it's a story we need to know because it affects our view on dairy. Can we, if this is the case, and more climate, uh, say, catastrophes hit the globe on different parts of the world, will we still have a permit to operate the amount of gas to make our powders? Or will we have to reconsider the entire supply chains with more local for local processing? Those are questions that strategists in the dairy processing sector will face, and those questions will go upstream to where the farms of the future will be and what those farms should look like. And we've seen a superb example on Sunday afternoon of what a very advanced farm can look like and what that means. But just imagine that more climate catastrophes come our way, that those catastrophes will indeed lead to a global agreement that something needs to be done beyond what we're doing today, and we all feel we're doing today, but actually we're not doing too much, then the question is, what will it mean for the dairy industry? And are you, in your research setting, are you prepared for the question, let alone for the answer? Now, here's a very wordy slide, but the key message here is, it's unpredictable, it's delayed, we're too late, and we're still too slow, and we still don't have our act together as societies across the globe, because this is a global problem. It's disorderly, and there's no such thing as one size fits all, but for the traditional proud, sorry, Jess, proud European dairy sector, this is not good news. And we'd better, better consider it, whereas it may have opportunities for other parts of the world. There's no single story about the future of energy, but there's a, probably a consensus that Europe will not be in a favorable position, and anything, any energy intensive in Europe serving the world market will not be in a favorable competitive position. So if your farm is delivering for the world market and depending on energy to be competitive, think twice. Plenty of implications, we're already mentioning some, and the impact on farm and how you can adapt those farms, the impact in the supply chain, logistic from farm to processor, we heard earlier this week that 400 kilometers was not an exception from farm to processor. Will that fit in with this picture in the long term? Or do we need to reconsider options? Do we need to have an RO, a reverse osmosis unit, on a large farm based on solar energy that takes at least half of the water out before the milk leaves the farm? Will those sort of options be the, the future? And I'm checking, Miron, whether you have some ideas on this. So, in a nutshell, where will we go? And the answer is that depends on your choices. Because there's many choices to make for different countries, many research topics to, uh, to cater for, and we're very curious to hear those choices, aren't we? Uh? Yeah, exactly. Because now it's also time to take up your phones, not to make a picture, but we want to make a word cloud together with you on the question, what are the implications and impacts for the dairy world of this new energy transition, what Eric just explained to you. So for this, just click one more, oh, or we do it like this. Just go to, to menti.com and type in the, the code 21529446 and then answer this question by typing in keywords, no phrases, and then at the end we will have something like this. So now, please 
get your phone, take up your laptop, and then go to menti.com and just answer those, this question. And we call on everybody online to please participate. Because the more views we get, the better. Yes, so every, everyone has typed in the code. Then I would like to ask the, the technician to let us show how the word cloud is moving and what is popping up. Ah, sorry, this was too fast. <laughs> The code is also here, uh, 2159446, here on the, on the top. So don't have a look on the screen, have a look on your phone so that you will not get influenced by what has been written already. Just, just move back so that, that please, that, that we can see, see it moving. So, Eric, what do you think? What, what will be the most frequent answer on this question? We see a lot of movements, a lot of changes at the moment here. So, what, 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 what do you think has, what is the biggest implication and impact for the dairy world? The in my humble view, but we've got so many brains around the room, so I'm glad we have, um, we have this Mentimeter. In my humble view, the single most important factor is that energy is no longer irrelevant when determining the value of a supply chain or the competitiveness of a supply chain to serve the world with dairy. Yeah, fully agree. So yeah. this is also what, what we can also, if we just have a... Yeah real life discussion on what is happening there, we yeah. see the costs are increasing. Yeah. We see cost yeah. is one of the most mentioned words. What, is yeah. wh what will be the biggest impact yeah. on the dairy world with this energy transition, what you just explained? I believe we all should consider this meeting a success when all of you go home realizing that energy is a factor that will determine competitiveness. So I'm so pleased to see that word competitiveness because the world is being redrawn. We've seen it happening in energy. We all identify food security as a key item for the future, but food security and energy security are not fully aligned yet. And competitiveness for the world market serving those that depend on good nutrition, say on imports, Getting that competitiveness equation redrawn, I think that's a real, a real point for the next years. Yeah, I think that's a good summary, so to say. And we see participants, uh, they're still coming in some more. So I think we can, we can leave it open. And, uh, but at the end, we see competitiveness is increasing and increasing. I don't know if they're now typing in this because you also have explained them a bit more. So let's see. And we will keep it open, so whenever you also have some other ideas, always feel free to type it in, and we also will share this later with you with the sent out material, so that you will get also this word cloud to really see what was really mentioned at the end there. Yeah, and, and if there's any points you'd like to make, either now or later to Philip or myself, please do so, because this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. So we truly value your inputs in say, not only uh, looking at farm economics, but also looking at what does energy mean for farm economics for the future and, and make that part of the, um, the IFCN Ford leadership in dairy. Yes, good. Thanks a lot. May I ask the... Thank you. So then, let's move on with the outlook. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Eric. I think Eric was talking about a, lot, a lot about the energy dynamics. Now is also the question, energy and dairy, is it an uneasy marriage even at the end? What will happen in the future and how the future is looking like for the dairy world? Let's have a look into the dairy world 2030, which is not that far away because it's only seven more years to go. 
as Lukas already mentioned in his presentation in the beginning, there are shocks, there are mega trends. Some shocks, like the energy transition, the energy crisis, can turn into a mega trend and can disrupt the whole dairy world. And then the picture is not like we have seen it anymore nowadays. It's changing dramatically. What are mega trends which we are also including into our long term outlook and into the future of the dairy world? You see, cost of milk production impacted also by higher energy prices and also at the end also impacting the buffer capacity and the investment behavior of the farmer. The higher the costs, the milk price stability or what we have seen decreasing milk prices, really low milk prices in Latvia will impact the investment behavior. Farm consolidation further going on, uh, the productivity and efficiency is increasing, is getting higher. So we see their technological pro progress, demand growth, what I was also mentioning yesterday. There is no limitation almost for demand growth. There's the only limitation is the availability. So at the end, the milk alternatives are popping up. They are getting more and more, but the noise is louder than the real impact at the end. And labor versus automation, what we also were discussing yesterday in my group with the very large farms, it's getting more and more optimized to really overcome those future challenges. And at the end, is there deglobalization or a globalization? And the shocks, economic shocks, maybe for Argentina it's not a shock, it's already a kind of mega trend, so maybe exclude Argentina, that is already in the next stage. But for, for the rest of the, the world almost, it is the a shock with the stagflation and the rising interest rates and the high exchange rates. The price shift, what we can see, the energy crisis, the labor market, which is getting also more and more difficult to get labor, what we were also hearing from uh, in, the, in the panel discussion yesterday, it's more and more getting difficult to find qualified labor who are also want to work on a dairy farm, even if it is a competitive salary. They just don't want to work in a dairy farm. At the end also, the war and the conflicts globally, so there's more and more pressure coming. And as Lukas was saying, let's have a look if we are on the right path. Are we in the right direction? Or is there something what we need to change? But now let's shortly, before going into the res results, how can those megatrends shape the dairy world? And how can they impact? So, climate change and environment will have an impact like more droughts, more floods, impacting feed production, but also the, the, the cows itself. So we see there is a lot of pressure coming from the environmental side. The demographics, what, what has been also touched, finding successors is getting more and more difficult in Europe, but also across the world, because there's also lack of labor at the end, and also an aging farmer and with the competitive salaries, even don't finding any successors is getting more and more problem and will speed up the farm consolidation process. And at the end also the volatile geopolitics and the supply chain disruptions are uh, having a direct impact and are already megatrends which are shaping the dairy world. But on the other side, we also have a shift in productivity because we have adaptation, and at the on the other side also consolidation. So we see more and more going on, which is, can be also positive seen as a positive trend in megatrends. So this is not everything about negativity, there's also positive things going on. And at the end, there's the big question, will there be enough food? And will there even enough milk? So now let's have a look on how those results are looking like and what we currently expect until 2030. Because therefore we developed in IOCN since 2013 a database and we are always sending also the preliminary results with you in our land work and getting your feedback. So that's why it's also crucial to understand what do you think into the future. And if you're contributing and helping, we are always happy and uh, sharing with you also our results. So if you have been providing us with your thoughts, you will also get after the conference in the upcoming days, the results, how you we see the dairy future until 2050. So at the end, you can use this also to see what is happening and to also convince, for example, at the end, 
the, the government or your country f f uh, followers how the future might look like and where maybe some changes needs to be done. So now let's have a look in what are the results. But before going into the results, another step what is important, setting up scenarios. Therefore, you need a matrix. We developed the, the matrix on one side, demand, on the other side, policy and economics, which is driving at the end also supply. Positive for demand can be strong prefer preferences for dairy products, but negative demand can be more dairy-free, at the end, dairy-free diets, but at the end, also the food waste. If we increase wasting food, it will also have a huge impact on demand. And not only on demand, but also on supply. Because at the end, maybe we don't need to increase by 2, 4, 5 percent what we have seen in the past. If we just increase the, or decrease the food waste, not increase the, uh, decrease the food waste, we maybe don't even need to grow much more with supply. <coughs> but now, shortly having a look, what are the results? Income restricted. Demand is growing, but politics and economics are not good. On the other side, stagnation shrinking, or rich and picky. But at the end, we in IFCN believe we will be still in the pro-dairy scenario. So demand and supply will be growing what we can see. And what are the fundaments and the assumptions of this scenario for the global level? This is just for the global level. It can be, for example, that the US will be more in the rich and picky situation or we will see European more in the stagnation or shrinking. But at the end, for the globe, we think pro-dairy scenario is still valid on the global level. What does it mean, pro-dairy scenario? The assumptions are GDP is growing, so we see economy is growing, <coughs> and the exchange rate will be stable. We will have a relatively high <coughs> sorry, oil price of 80 to 85 US dollar per barrel, an increasing feed price, because in the past we have seen a feed price on average 20 to 23 US dollar. But now, with higher oil prices, more and more energy transition, the feed price is also going to increase and we will have, until 2050, on average a feed price of 27 to 30 US dollar. And with this, also higher milk prices of 45 to 48 uh, US dollar as an assumption to model the results as input, so to say. So now, Weird animation, but now let's have a look on what is going on and what are the results until 2030. So in this table you see what we predict and what the model is telling us until 2040 with the last decades as well. And what we can see is the growth is slowing down for supply and respectively all also for demand. If supply is slowing down, demand can increase. But if it's increasing much faster, the unsatisfied demand, what I was also talking yesterday about, is increasing. So we will see much more unsatisfied demand ar around, the, around the globe. Because if we compare it with the previous years, so from 2020 to 2010, we were increasing by 2.6%. So almost one percentage growth less on the global level. So it's a huge impact on the supply side already. And what is also remarkable, if we have a look on the next one, on the world trade. Because yesterday there was also the question, will it be more globalization or more localization? Local for, lo uh, uh, local for global or local for local? What do we see? We see an increase of only 4% growth. And if we compare it with the last decade, 50%. What does it mean? Less trade. Increasing unsatisfied demand because the emerging markets are not able to pick up in production that fast because the transition can be from now to another day. It can, it's not like this, that you transfer from a small-scale farm to a 1,000 dairy farm. It's not like this. It needs transition. What we also see in China, for example, there is a huge transition and a huge global globalization. So at the end, trade is slowing down. And why? Is production somehow slowing down? Because we will see more and more pressure coming to the dairy farmers with the environmental regulations. So the 
animals on a global level we assume is going to be go uh, uh, slowing down but the average milk yield due to the technology technological process is increasing by 19% in the uh, from 2020 to 2030 so we see an increasing technologization and an increasing at the end also uh, average farm size so the consolidation process is increasing which is also at the end also increasing the yield and if we have a look at the demand drivers, what is driving the demand? We see we are still on a low level. The dairy consumption per capita on a level of 130 kg milk uh, per year on average in 2030. Yesterday, Rigoberto was saying they are consuming 160 liters of cola in, in, in Mexico. So if you compare this with the 130 on a global level, you see there's a huge potential to be activated. And as I said, the only problem is availability and increasing unsatisfied demand at the end, most probably. But now let's have a look. How will be this milk going to be produced? We see, if we have a look on how it will be produced, we see that only 0.2% of all farms around the world are above 100 who are at the end also feeding the world because they are the main driver for the exports those 0.2 percent having 18 percent of the cows but at the end they're producing 44 percent of the global milk production 44 percent and if we destroy only this small number, you see how much milk will be gone. Because the small-scale farmers would in, in Bangladesh most probably will not pick up that fast. It's almost impossible. So, at the end, unsatisfied demand is increasing. Or, prices will go to levels which you haven't seen before, which you most probably even cannot believe. 80 US dollar of dairy prices. Who, th who can imagine such kind of prices? And at the end, who is willing to afford at such kind of level? Because if we now also see where are those 0.2% of the farms located? In Europe. 50,000 farms are almost in Europe. Now, is the EU, EU Commission is coming and saying, I don't want to have these farms. They're bad for the environment. So what's next? Who should come up? There could be some potentials lying in the US as a golden opportunity. Maybe same like for energy. New area, new era, golden era for US. Maybe some parts of Latin America. But how long we are already talking about Latin America, the golden future? When will it come through? We can take, talk more 10 years ago, or at last 10 years, we were already talking Latin America can be the new area where to produce the milk and who can feed the world. But what happened so far? It's like if you're a talented football player with 18, you're a talent, but the older you get, at some point you're still a talent, but you will miss the chance to become then at the end a real profi and play in the first league. So let's see if Latin America is still a young talent or if it's already too late to grow up and go to the first league. So now let's have a look on the developments as well and the speed of consolidation. Because as I said, there's a huge variety and the difference is really big if we compare the different, um, um, uh, different regions in, around the world. If we start with the small and household farms, mainly allocated in South Africa and, and South A uh, in Africa and South Asia, they're mainly led by elder people, they're for household consumption or for the informal market. And what is their main issue to grow? Access to capital. Even if they want to go to 100 cows or even just to increase to 10, 20 cows, who wants to give those kind of farmers the money? 
it's a big issue. If we go on for the medium and family size farms, which are mainly allocated in the EU and Latin America, we have already some employees working there, we have still the family owner, but the main problem is also a successor. Who wants to overtake this farm? Less and less people want to work on the dairy farm. And the main issue is also, if we maybe not only look in, on Europe, but also in Latin America, the stability, the politics, and also the infrastructure which is not set up, at least in Latin America, that well, if we have a whole picture on it. And the large and business uh, farm classes, which are mainly in the US and Oceania, we see we have employees, it generates an return, uh, expected return on investment, we have a management level systems there, but at the end, the environmental restrictions. Is it climate change or new, and all, uh, new legislations and regulations who are limit the further growth. So if we now have a look on how the main producers are going to develop and have a look on the surplus regions of the main exporters, so what are the powerhouses? We see Oceania and Western Europe are the major powerhouses to feed and supply the world. But it's a bearish market tone until 2030. We see less surplus and this less surplus is due, driven due to lower supply, because we have more and more regulations. We have a shortage of labor. So there's more and more pressure coming. So less supply, relatively stable demand, maybe slightly decreasing, will lead to less surplus. So and even in 2030, we are expecting, with these assumptions, that Western Europe will have the same amount of surplus like in Oceania. And if we move on, to the next ones, to Latin America and Eastern Europe, we have a stable or bullish market tone. We can see an increasing surplus, so they can overtake some of the losses, what we see here for, for Oceania and Western Europe. But at the end, they are also facing some problems, like the instability, like politics, like also environmental restriction, the climate change. But at the end, they are still able to activate some of the growth, so there is growth potential. And then at the end, who is missing? The US, which is also a bullish market, what we, what we expect there. Surplus is still increasing. So there is the possibility to feed the world from North America. But it also has some limitations, because natural resources, the climate change, so we see more and more problems also coming to them, even if they have the capacity and the availability of land and the access to capital to invest. But the question mark is, how much are they going to do? So at the end, it's the question, out of this more milk which is produced in North America, Eastern Europe, Latin America, how much of this milk will be available for exports? And how much is just for the increasing local consumption? Because with people getting richer, at the end they also want to consume more dairy. And we have seen this with the increasing GDP growth, what, we, we, what is the underlying of this model. And at the end, or will we increase the local for local production, as I said. So there is more production, but not at the end for the globalization and the global market, just to satisfy the internal, internal um, consumption. And if we have a look on the whole picture for the whole world, in 2030, with our modeling results, Demand is already increasing faster than supply. So we have a disbalance. So prices might be even higher than this 45 to 48 US dollar, what we were estimating. So we see a disbalance. We see more and more demand increasing and supply is not, cannot pick up. Because there are also some game changers around. Environmental regulations, which we have been discussing already quite often in the, in the past days. Veganism, which might pop up, the climate shocks, the inflation, environmental regulations, but there's also some technology which can improve. And why do we think demand will be stronger than supply? Because there I also want to refer to Eric, who was doing this uh, also. If we have a look on the 12 major dairy importers plus China, Self-sufficiency has not increased in the past 10 years. 
it has been dropping. So we see, and this is also the evidence, why we believe demand is growing stronger than supply and there will be a disbalance. Because we see those countries are decreasing in self-sufficiency. There are some who are increasing or stable, but at the end, if we take the weighted average on the population, we see it's decreasing. I will hurry up. Yes, Shin. Thank you for reminding. So what does it mean? You need to understand what is happening in the dairy world. Because subsidies are popping up, but they will not change the, the global needle. It's, it's just the noise at the end. The demand for dairy products is almost unlimited. We have all 8 million people living on the world. On average, 130 kg only uh, uh, drinking or consuming dairy products. It's almost nothing. So the growth is almost unlimited. If there would be not the av availability issue. So at the end, there will be a global battle to access those dairy products. Because also the FAO nowadays acknowledges more and more the critical human dietary of the relevance of animal protein. Because it's, as I said also yesterday, dairy is and has nutrition and is high nutritional. Not like McDonald's, what I was saying. So let's see. At the end also, due to this rising inflation, prices will even increase higher than what we have seen in the past. And what is also remarkable is that food security is back on the agenda of the government, not only in emerging markets, also for the European Union. So we see it's coming back to the market. And if we now shortly go also into scenarios, because scenarios, as Eric was mentioned, is important to understand what is happening. And related to the topic, energy prices. We see demand, there are different scenarios. Oil price, there are different scenarios. This will also have an impact for the dairy industry. Because er, as, as we have seen, most of the, uh, or some of the, the answers were also related to costs. So higher oil prices, higher gas prices, at the end will also have an impact on the cost of milk production. <coughs> and now let's have shortly a look on what does it mean, so to say, for the comparison with the baseline scenario. Just having a look now for the three major producers who can or who are at the moment feeding the world, so to say. Let's assume that uh, the rising demand will stay steady and we will have the scenario, energy prices will go even further up. And the additional pressure is coming to the farmers, not only to the farmers, also to the processors and to the consumers at the end. But assuming now in this scenario that demand will be not affected by higher prices in this case, so it's a hypothetical in, uh, case, what do we see? Less production from Oceania, less production from the US, less production from EU, and at the end, there's only 1.1 million ton more to feed the world. So even less. So we see 1.1 million ton more to go and feed the world, to bring this nutritional high product to the end consumer. So it will get more and more the local for local production than the local for global production. So at the end, the dairy market looks to remain a seller market. So the picture is somehow changing. So there is no crystal ball. So everything what I was showing based on the IFCN uh, models and tools <coughs> and also with your input from, uh, from, from you. So, what to summarize my presentation? It really depends how much we are growing in supply to see how much dairy imports at the end will be feasible. So that's why also national strategies, especially for the net importing countries, are needed to stimulate the domestic production and to overcome this problem. We will have a shortage of milk. Because in 2030, with the baseline scenario, we are already missing 5 million tons. So we will see affordability issues and increasing unsatisfied demand. And at the end, the world market supply and demand together will de determine the prices. So my last question to you is, are you ready for prices of 80 US dollars per 100 kg of milk? With this, 
Thank you. <laughs> Am I on? Yes, I'm on. Great. Thank you. Very <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you very much, Philip, Eric. I think this was a wonderful start. So, um, for now, I want to take you on a little journey across the globe, and I want to invite Matthew on stage. Matthew is from New Zealand. He will be presenting the New Zealand view. He's a long-standing dairy expert working for the, was working for the government and now is in transition phase becoming a private dairy expert. So please, Matthew, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. Good morning. And I should also say good evening because in New Zealand, it is now around about 8.30. So uh, it's, it's also winter, so it's nice to come over to this side of the world and enjoy some summer and hospitality and, of course, share our knowledge uh, with the rest of the world and, and learn. Um, what I'm going to cover today is uh, a little bit about energy in New Zealand, uh, our greenhouse gas situation, and ultimately uh, about our future milk production and where that's heading. And I don't necessarily disagree with what we've heard. It's, it's very much in, in keeping uh, with, with where we're going. So in New Zealand, we're quite, quite unique. We're pri our primary sectors, which include our agriculture, our horticulture, our forestry, our um, fisheries, so our natural resources, are what drives our economy. That, coupled with tourism and, um, and some technology. That is what our country is about. And we're proud of that, we're good at it, and dairy is at the, at the top of that. Um, to quote a uh, previous uh, Prime Minister, Mr John Key, he said, when Fonterra sneezes, New Zealand catches a cold. And it's so true. And in fact, we could apply that to the rest of the world because we're such a large exporter of dairy products. Now, we've talked quite a lot at the conference already about this period of change, and we're all facing it. And it's coming from all sorts of different areas. And it's how we adjust and how we uh, cope with those changes. And a lot of them are very similar across the world. It's just slightly nuanced to your own region. And yeah, but it's about how businesses adjust, uh, adjust their business models uh, and their operations. And that's what's going to be important going forward. In terms of milk uh, production in New Zealand, the key drivers, obviously, and in, in just listening to Philip, demand is at the top of that. So if we don't have demand for dairy products, no one will supply. So it's demand driving what happens around the world with the supply. And that can be push-pull. So it can be for nutrition, as we talk about, but it can also be innovative dairy products uh, that businesses are creating and providing there's a willingness to purchase those, they will c carry on and, and sell them, but they need milk production to do that. Land. Land's an important asset. And New Zealand's a small country. We do, not, we do not have a lot of land. However, we have enough land for dairy. In fact, there's enough land that we could double our dairy production if we wanted. Enough suitable land for dairy. But that will not happen. It will not happen for a number of factors. Public perceptions. So we've into the, an era of people being quite aware of the environment and around how um, businesses operate. So it's not just the environment, we've got animal standards and welfare and um, energy use, is, it, it, it carries on. So public and consumers, because our consumers are all around the world, we export to over 100 different countries, and our local um, people will determine what can happen in the future. 
We have um, environmental regulations coming. They've been coming for a long time and they're still being sorted out. It's challenging, it's very difficult. In New Zealand we talk about water quality and we have regional um, regulations uh, for farmers to meet. And in some cases that means land can no longer convert to dairy. So new land changing uh, from sheep and beef or some other land use into dairy. And I'll talk more about the greenhouse gas situation shortly. Um, milk prices and profits. Without profits, businesses cannot survive. They cannot um, reinvest into infrastructure, they cannot grow, uh, they cannot replace machinery, they cannot take care of the environment because that takes capital. In New Zealand, as you're aware, we're a pasture-based system, uh, 80 to 85 percent, or 85 percent is coming from pasture. We rely on the weather. The weather will determine what happens with our production ultimately, but we're talking within a small band, generally 3 to 4 percent per year, plus minus from the weather. Labour. Labour and management. We all rely on good people and we're all facing the same sort of situation here where not everyone wants to go and milk dairy cows. My 17 year old son spent last summer milking on a dairy farm. He saved a lot of money, he bought himself a ute. He's only 17. But he said, Dad, I don't want to work in the dairy industry, I don't want to milk cows every day. I want to go and work in the sheep and beef industry. And he's doing an apprenticeship now in the middle of uh, in the North Island. He's on a very large uh, operation, 25,000 ewes, uh, 1,500 Angus beef cattle, and he's loving it. And he's getting the training he needs to go further forward. And that's brilliant. But how do we attract and keep the people in the dairy industry? And that's an important thing. Now, in terms of the other 15% of our feed, and this has sort of been a little bit unknown to a lot of people, this study I did um, four or five years ago uh, when I was working for Dairy NZ, and it quantifies um, the different feeds. If you see the bottom graph, I know it's going to be a little bit hard to see, but the dark green is palm kernel coming in from Indonesia and Malaysia. It's a counts for about 6% of a cow's diet on average across New Zealand. We also bring in a little bit of soya bean, tapioca and cottonseed uh, meal. Not a lot, just a little bit. But the majority of our non-pasture feeds is crops. And most of those, apart from maize silage, are, are where cows are grazing crops. So we're very much a grazing system still rely on the weather, and we still rely on land. And I know I've heard people say, we're going to see some land use change, we're going to have some less land and dairy, and we'll, have, we'll grow our horticulture systems, which are very profitable, and we'll grow our arable systems. Well, in New Zealand, most of our arable systems are growing feed for our dairy cows. So if we're not growing our dairy cows anymore, why would we continue to grow um, uh, more crops? You can see I've put um, the dairy production growth um, in, in litres, millions of litres, next to that feed, even though it's only a small proportion. And there's quite a good correlation. We've seen the big increase, and now it's levelled off. And the same with the, with the um, non-pasture feeds as well. However, the focus is on growing more pasture and utilising pasture always. New Zealand's emissions profiles. Again, we're unique. Half of our greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. In most developing countries, it's around about 10 or 11 percent, much smaller. So we have a unique position here of how do we reduce our environmental footprint, uh, greenhouse gases, when we have a biological system. 
In terms of dairy, dairy is about half of our agriculture emissions, or 23% of greenhouse gases. So you can see the dilemma that we're facing. And while we have the, um, the big international targets of, of net zero by 2050, we also have, New Zealand government has a target of reducing greenhouse gases by 30% by 2030, which isn't far away, from a 2005 base. And from what I have heard, I think we're around about 11, 12, maybe 13% of the way to doing that. In terms of the dairy industry, where are those emissions coming from? Most of them are coming from dairy cows, methane. 10% from the processing industry and only 5% from transportation. Most of our emissions are methane, short-lived gas. How do we reduce it? It's a tough question. In New Zealand, we have a group set up. It's called the Haywaka Ekanoa Group. It's a Maori term. Uh, what it means is uh, well, I'll say it's, it's got the government, it's got our, our sectors, all of our sectors, not just dairy. Um, it has um, Maori involvement as well, so indigenous people. And it's about trying to come up with solutions for reducing greenhouse gases. And what the term means is we're all in the, in the waka. A waka is a canoe or a boat. We're all in this boat together and we're all paddling together to try and solve this problem. It was set up as a five-year program, and it's about empowering farmers um, to understand what their emissions are, to be able to calculate them, to be able to manage them, and to be able to look for solutions and, and how to be more resilient around greenhouse gases and the environment. They have recommended um, introducing a farm-level split gas um, levy uh, for farmers. So they pay into a scheme based on how much greenhouse gas emissions they emit. And it's very much linked to feed, which is linked to production. That may take a few years to set up. They were hoping to get it set up by uh, 2025, but it's probably going to take a little bit longer. This is my own view. I think it will take a little bit longer to get it set up. That means creating um, a new system. It means capturing data from farms, quite a lot of detailed data. And when we bring in the water quality element, we're talking bulk data to analyse and to help make decisions. I think, John, you said more data than a, than a farmer can manage, and I agree. I think it's going to be a lot. In terms of mitigations on farm at the moment, what, what options do we have? Genetics, of course play a role in selecting for lower emitting animals. Thinking about our nutrient use, and uh, there are some uh, crops that are, are better in terms of emissions. Energy use, of course. Talk more about that. Winter grazing, our options around winter grazing on farms. And really what we're talking about is a system. This is a whole farm system. And we're talking about reductions or reductions in inputs um, to try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, reductions in inputs will likely lead to reductions in outputs as well. So this is what we're facing at the moment. And until such time as there are vaccines and methane inhibitors available for New Zealand pasture grazing systems, um, we are relying on, on some farm system change at the moment. Now there's work going on in those things and I know um, they will come but they're not, not here with us yet. In terms of energy use in New Zealand, um, we're quite fortunate, we're fairly self-sustained and uh, we're, we're fairly reliant on, um, on sustainable energy use. So geothermal, natural gas and hydro are a big part of our um, energy use. It's around about 50%. The ones where we're concentrating on is use of coal and oil, of course. So looking to reduce those. 
And in New Zealand, the, in, uh, the big use, users of coal are the dairy industry and the steel industry. Fonterra has big plans around the environment. They're investing a billion dollars over the next five, six years, it's already started, to convert six coal sites into um, sustainable energy uh, use. Now, that's not easy. This is leading edge stuff. We've got to get temperatures up to 200 degrees to turn milk into powder. And we're now going to change to using heat pump technology and also uh, wood bio biomass uh, boilers. So quite a change. Uh, they're also, like everyone else, looking at electrical use for um, transportation. And they've got the first, I believe, uh, Volvo truck um, using electricity and testing and, and refining. And they want to convert their fleet um, and cars as well uh, to use uh, sustainable energy in the future and, and less reliance on oil. So what do we see for the next decade? I think we're going to be in a period of evolution, not revolution. I don't think we're going to see a big, big change all of a sudden. It's going to take time. These issues are big and difficult. We're going to see more large-scale corporate farms around the world, but definitely more in New Zealand. More focus on sustainability and the environment. Mentioned before, more requirement for monitoring and, and data opportunities for IFCN, AB Agri. I think we're going to see some more technology enabled productivity in the future and a lot more artificial intelligence. And a lot of these things are already here, um, and there'll be more, and they'll get more, more use. We talked about processing and transport efficiencies. But here's the key thing. New Zealand's strategy is going to move, and it's starting to move already, away from volume-based to more value-based. We will look to um, uh, yeah, change our product mix a little bit. Instead of just being raw powder, maybe more infant formula. And we've seen that, just as an example. So the next decade's likely to be evolutional and we all need to work together. And when I say we, I'm talking globally so that our farmers and our industry can remain resilient. In terms of production, the growth is over. I think for the next five or six years, it's going to be fairly flat. There's going to be some wobble, but fairly flat. And then... In the 2030s, I think we're going to start to come off the peak and head, head down a little bit. So just in summary, larger farms, very important. New Zealand's important. We're still going to have as much or similar amount of milk, but we ain't growing. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. If there's demand in the world, like Philip said, someone will fill it. Or, if they don't, we're looking at higher prices. And that's not a bad thing from a New Zealand perspective because costs have gone up. In the last three years, in New Zealand, costs have gone up $1.50 per kilo of milk solids. So we used to talk about pre-COVID, 6 to $6.50 was needed to break even. We now need seven fifty or even $8 to break even. So we need a higher price. More value, not less volumes perhaps, or a little less, but not, not huge. Reputation, brand reputation is going to be important, absolutely important. So doing these things, we don't have a choice. We have to do these things. If we don't do these things, our industry will end. And that's why New Zealand is taking the leading edge in trying to... Uh, improve and take care of our environment uh, before it's too late. We need to work together on this. This is a big challenge. Thank you.
<clears throat> thank you, Matthew. I think thank you for you know putting another piece of puzzle into the topic of environment sustainability. I think yeah, like you said, issues with water, with land. Uh, we will need more monitoring. We we will need to go more for value, not for volume, and see what we can do together. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. We would like to then move forward. Uh, just one technical point, please note down all your questions. Uh, we will have later panel discussion when you will be able to ask questions to the uh, uh, speakers and to the panelists. And also the same for the online audience. If you have any questions, please put it down. We have uh, Gerta, who is she's working on the chat. She will later collect some of those questions and pass it to the panel. So, we would like to move forward. We would like to move back to Europe, and we would like to move to Ukraine. Ukraine is currently fighting for independence. Ukraine is currently fighting for values of the democratic world, but Ukraine is also fighting for agriculture and their own farmers. And that's why it's my pleasure to introduce Olga Kozak, you know her very well. She's our research partner representing AgriScope, Agroscope, and also her colleague, Hanna Levreniuk. She is a general director of the Association of Milk Producers in Ukraine. So please, ladies, tell us your story. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you all for supporting Ukraine in this terrible uh, time we are going through. This is very, very important for us, and you will understand later after our presentation. And yes, our presentation is, um, is will focus on the impact of the war uh, on the dairy, internal and global dairy sector. So. Let's start. Here is the, the main uh, uh, topics we are going to cover. Let's get started. Who we are? I start with myself. You know me. I'm Olga Kozak, and before the war, I um, worked as a researcher at, at the Institute of Agrarian Economics in Kyiv, mainly um, related to the dairy sector. My research is mainly related to the dairy sector. After the invasion, thanks to Agroscope, Swiss um, Center of uh, Excellence for Agricultural Research, I uh, continue my scientific activity in the same group of, uh, with uh, Christian Gazarin. He's here, thanks God. And, of course, I want to mention that I have been a scientific partner of IFCN, representing the Ukrainian dairy sector since 2008. Very sustainable partner for many years. I will share my presentation with Hanna Lavrenyuk, who is CEO of the Association of Milk Producers of Ukraine, a very powerful organization. The main lobbyist for farmers, for dairy farmers at state level, uh, since the first day of invasion, the association has been helping farmers in all possible and impossible ways. Hanna, please say a few words about your organization. Thank you, Olha. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here together with you and to get the insight about the uh, insights about the future development of the dairy business and dairy farming in Ukraine. And if we're talking about Association of Milk Producers of Ukraine, this is the only professional union of dairy farmers in Ukraine, established 2009 and growing from 10 uh, farmers that were uh, there first the pioneers to establish it to more than 150 dairy farmers from all over Ukraine as of the 1st January 2022, before the full scale of war, uh, that together produced 30% of milk sent for processing in Ukraine. But unfortunately at the moment still 20 farms of our members are under occupation. Association Milk Producers of Ukraine um, had its main mission as import of best technologies, approaches and and insights to uh, Ukrainian dairy sector to make it more competitive and effective. 
we have the biggest consultancy center or in Europe, independent consultancy center of veterinarians, technologists, nutritionists, and so on and so forth, our own laboratory, educational extension centers, and uh, other uh, tasks that we fulfill for our farmers. But with this full-scale war started by Russia against Ukraine, uh, we uh, shifted our tasks and our missions also to humanitarian support of our farmers for them to be able to survive and to recover as soon as possible. And also helping and feeding uh, our Ministry of Agriculture and our government with the ideas and support for developing the new agricultural policy for us to be able to recover as soon as possible and to defend our country. Thank you, Hannah. So, 475 days, Ukraine, uh, Russians' wars against Ukraine. Our armed forces uh, is fighting for our independence, and 475 days, our dairy sector is uh, in struggling many problems caused by the war. It's migration, occupation, minefields, thefts of the grain by invaders, lack of personnel, and these are only some problems directly affected the dairy sector. But to understand the complete picture, I would like to, to remind you what Ukraine was like before the war. A, a second largest country in Europe, supplying the world for, with food for centuries, Ukraine he has long-standing tradition of agriculture. We are West, mainly flat agricultural land resources and favorable climate conditions. Uh, historically, Ukraine produced much more products that can consume. That's why our, our country is export-oriented. And um, yes, all internal infrastructure and transport infrastructure were set up for supporting export. In 2021, we have 17% of country's population employed in agriculture, contributing 12% of GDP and 41% of its export. The crop production grew consistently and the same applied to agricultural export. In 2014, after the revolution of dignity, Ukraine signed the, the historical association agreement with the European Union, proving her, her wish to be a part of a European family. And this decision caused uh, the occupation of Crimea and uh, a Russian, pro-Russian separatist rebellion. That was actually the beginning of the war. Yes, but let's go back to the to the year before the war, which was for agriculture a very successful year for Ukraine. It, it's not only in terms of uh, harvest and yield, but also in terms of finances. We've got very good yield across the country, very low prices in uh, input prices in the spring in, and high prices in the autumn. And the year was really, really profitable for, for the farmers. And it applies for the dairy farmers as well due to the structure of Ukrainian farms where dairy is only a sector of the whole farm, usually typically produced uh, crops as well. And 2021 was also a record year for agricultural export. Every month Ukraine exported more than five, five million uh, tons of uh, of agricultural commodities uh, around the world, uh, mainly we are our uh, seaports and uh, wheat and and corn were considered the most uh, significant and important export commodity due to the volumes of 20 and 25 million tons. And when Russians blocked our ports, the significant disappearance of the big volume of agricultural products from the international from from the international trade had its consequences so the the export was blocked nobody knew what what would happen in the future and this uncertainly increased the the prices for food and feed in the world and the solution was needed the urgent solution was required and the first solution made by European Commission who introduced the Solidarity Lanes Action Plan, plan to, uh, 
to open the, the alternative routes for Ukrainian agriculture export. It was very, it was very helpful, but had many, many challenges. And the, the, the biggest one was the limited capacity of the European ports. So a million of tons of Ukrainian grain and, and uh, oil seeds were still not being exported. Uh, then, with the help of our international partners, the United Nations and Turkey, uh, the initial great deal was signed uh, to, 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 to ensure the, the, safe, uh, the safe export, agriculture export for Ukrainian ports. And um, yes, the, the, the shortage of wheat, I should say that the shortage of wheat impacted the, con the people from the poor countries, but the shortage of corn and other fodder exported from Ukraine impacted milk and meat producers around the world. So when the, the second uh, uh, grain deal was signed, the, the graph shows that the efficiency of this both the solidarity lane plan and the grain deal, the, it, uh, uh, in instabilization of world price for feed and and uh, food. Uh, with the help of international partners, Ukraine could recover her export in 2022 and uh, continue to supply the world with food and feed. And yes, and one second, but, uh, but throughout the year, the Ukrainian farmers, the, the Ukrainian storages of grain was uh, had surplus and it's impacted the internal prices. So the farmers who produce grain for export, they decided to re redirect these flows from the, egg, from the trade to the uh, animal feeding. And the other farmers, they, they, they had possibility to buy cheap feed at the moment when the, the, the ports were blocked. Yes, but there, that not all the farmers could do it. Some farmers from the occupied and frontline zones, they, they faced a different reality. And about this different reality, uh, there is a milk producers, uh, milk production map in Ukraine and how it changed. Actually, uh, Kyiv School of Economics together with World Wide Bank and European Union and United Nations Development Program are co uh, constantly uh, conducting the investigations, the research too, uh, calculate how much losses and what consequences has the war to Ukraine and to the world and in the newest uh, results that calculated the consequences of the war in direct indirect losses to agricultural sector of Ukraine within one year of war uh, those investigators state that uh, direct and indirect losses have already amounted to 40 billion dollars to Ukrainian agricultural sector and if you are talking about livestock sector, 52% of all the losses are due to the losses in dairy farming and dairy processing. Why? Because 10 regions out of 24 regions of Ukraine were either occupied or at front line or deliberated but suffered a lot of losses. Uh, and on the map you can see uh, the green um, zones that Olha has indicated, those uh, are uh, the territories that were deoccupied, and pink zones are those that are still occupied and are suffering heavy shelling and destruction. And those territories, those 10 regions, were producing 42% of milk of Ukraine. Dairy farms, together with crop farms, grain storages, became the objects of aimed shelling to Russian soldiers to put panic, to pressure the population, to frighten it. And uh, according to estimations of association of milk producers, we have lost 50,000 cows in industrial um, farming sector. And uh, we started last year with uh, 430 almost thousand cows in industrial dairy sector. And we have lost 50,000 cows. More than 100 dairy farms were either heavily damaged or completely destroyed. But at the same time, uh, those farmers that are situated in central and western part of Ukraine have, uh, after the first shock, and Olha will tackle this uh, topic, what was the timeline of development and overcoming all the challenges for our farmers, they kept up with the production. And within a year, after a year of war, they even uh, were capable to increase their uh, cow herd population and also their yields 
to balance the losses that we have. And uh, as of 1st of May 2023, uh, we have lost 7% of our cow herd in industrial sector compared to the same period of 2022, but we have already increased the production of milk sent for processing by 7.7% .7 compared to the previous year. Olha. Yes, so here is the chronicles of 2022 for dairy industry of Ukraine. The first days and weeks of war, it was shock for the dairy industry. The supply chain between farmers, processors and uh, retailers were disrupted. Many, the logistics, logistics was destroyed. Many dairy plants stopped. Uh, farmers from the occupied or frontline zone uh, not being able to deliver milk gave it free to the locals or even dispose of it. The farmers uh, also in the front zone, they, to save the feed, they switch cows from the three times feeding to two times feeding, optimizing the diets and consciously reducing milk yield. But in the end of March, the, the dairy sector restarted, adjusting the new conditions and um, at the moment, uh, 4 million people had fled Ukraine and, and it's impacted the, the sales markets. So the, the processors, they, they decided to switch to the strategy to, proce to process the supplies of milk into the dairy products with long shelves life. And the government in this moment to save the dairy sector implemented the program that uh, they, they buy the, to purchase the supplies of uh, agri, uh, for, uh, milk dairy products for the military and humanitarian needs. This program worked only one and a half months due to the lack of uh, funds, but it was like a safer for the moment to the dairy sector. In April, the armed force of Ukraine liberated the north north regions and uh, the farms were se they had a severe destruction but no one farmers wanted to le to to stop working un unless the farm was completely destroyed hana will come to this again many uh, in internal and international uh, organization supports ukrainian dairy farms with humanitarian aid and uh, yes, we, we, after the deoccupation, de we realized the problem of mine fields. In May, the situation was critical because uh, the migration reached more than 5 million people, including children, the main uh, consumer of, uh, of dairy products. And uh, the, the demand fell significantly and the export was needed. And in June, the European Union they cancelled the quotas and tariffs for Ukrainian agricultural products, including dairy products, and it was really, really helpful. I will come back to this later. In autumn, Russia changed their strategy. They could not succeed on the front, uh, on the front and they decided to destroy our own energy system. Hanna. Yes, to make us surrender, but we have survived the toughest and the blackest times of Ukraine. And uh, because of terroristic attacks of Russian Federation to our energy system, our energy um, generation, generating and distributing system, uh, dairy farmers actually were the most sensitive points in the, in the economical system of Ukraine because we are very uh, high consuming in energy and we are very dependent on energy st uh, fixed and uh, constant sources of energy for the routines of the farm. But if you have only one or two hours of electricity supply per day or you don't have any electricity for days or weeks, it influences you immensely. Our dairy farmers had to switch to using electricity generators to support their productivity, but of course it led to, first of all, increase of the share of electricity expenditures in the cost production of milk by five, six times. It, of course, uh, led them to uh, buying uh, new and new generators because electricity generators were not designed to work more than two, three hours, but they were to, had to work for 24 to 7 for our farmers to continue working. And, of course, every hour of delay in the schedule of a dairy farm led to the drop in uh, milk yields. Every hour 
delay is one liter less milk yields per cow per day. And you have to, uh, to recover this, to resume your uh, previous levels of yields, you have to spend two, three, or even more months. That's why the uh, losses of the sector were immense, but still we survived. At the moment, it might seem that the problem is not uh, uh, anymore in Ukraine, does not exist. But I have to remind that 60% of Ukrainian energy structure were destroyed or heavily damaged by Russians. It's summer, that's why our production facilities do not consume that much of energy. But to restore, to recover those damages, we will need at least two years. And that's why at the moment, our government, together with our industry, are working on reconstruction and changing, uh, changing the approach to the energy system completely, to decentralize it, to use more green and clean uh, sources of energy, to use dairy farmers as the sources of energy also, but at the same time, as associational milk producers, we are appealing to the dairy community, to sponsors, to humanitarian organizations to help us within some months to get prepared to the next period of terroristic attacks from Russia. And for you not to have even a doubt that they will do the same, please remember June the 6th, when Russians blowed up the biggest hydroelectric station of Ukraine with the biggest dam, Kahovka, that led to flooding, to flushing of millions, millions cubic tons of water to the southern part of Ukraine that led to washing out houses, animals, farms, lives, that led to flooding 10,000, over 10,000 hectares of arable lands on the right bank of uh, Kherson region that is under control of Ukraine already, and times more thousand hectares of land on the left bank that led to the destruction of 32 irrigation uh, systems uh, in Ukraine that uh, helped our regions to irrigate their fields and to provide fodder also for dairy farmers. 94% of irrigation system of Kherson region is destroyed. 70% of the Purizhia region is destroyed. 30% of Dnipro region irrigation systems, feeding irrigation systems are destroyed. That's why we believe that they won't stop. That's the methods of their war. That's why we need your support in this. You, you want us to cry. Really? That's not the end. Guys, we have one more big challenge for Ukrainian farmers, and that's the contamination of our fields with explosives. 30% of our territory, of territory of Ukraine, and you know what size Ukraine is, second biggest European country. 30% of our territory now are mined. They are contaminated with explosives. Uh, about 2 million hectares of land uh, that was used for production of food uh, are now in urgent need for examination and demining. Among them, 170,000 hectares of land that need that urgently by the end of this year. Of course, our Ministry of Agriculture, Economics, Associations are working with the world community to uh, attract as much help as we can to solve that problem because with the current resources that we have, demining such, uh, such much territories will take us from 30 to 70 years. It's an incredible period of time. One autonomous machine can demine at, uh, in one day, during one day, only two hectares of land. And we need millions to be demined. Of course, our farmers do not stay, stay still or wait for something. They already are in uh, their fields. They are making, they are preparing themselves ri radio-controlled tractors uh, to try to demine the territories themselves. It is crucial for, for example, for eastern part of Ukraine, for Kharkiv region, that was in top three milk producers regions of Ukraine. But because of war, because of 10 months of occupation and no possibility at all to work in proper way, they left sunflower, maize, wheat in the field. They were not able in 2022 to harvest even a single hectare because of battles, because of mining, because of constant shelling. And if they do not have a possibility to demand at least some territory to be able to produce fodder, 
silage, hay for their cows, we will see another wave of decreasing of cow herd in Ukraine, another wave of <clears throat> migration of Ukrainian people from those territories, either to other territories of Ukraine, but probably and most probably to Europe again. To stop that disaster, we also need the support of uh, international community for us to solve that task. So let's, let's go back to the economy again. Ukraine, because it's an export-oriented country, was always uh, correlate with the world prices, at, it, the, in, with the world milk prices as well. But um, when the war started, migration, inflation, and the decreasing of purchasing power decreased the internal demand by 27%. And... Um, and the import was really, export was really, really needed. And Europe open gave us this possibility to export. And it was, it was in the right way because the, the gap between internal and global price was more than 50% some months. And it was very attractive for the, for the buyers. And uh, that's, uh, w that was one why of the reason why Ukrainian farmers survived. The other, the other two reasons I already mentioned, it was an incredible, profitable year, 2021, and the low feed prices during the, the blockade time. It was five months of blockade of Ukrainian export of grain. And yes, Ukraine was, until 2019, it was net exporter of um, dairy products, but the, because of the milk production reduction and increasing the demand inside the country, since 2019 until 2021, Ukraine was a net exporter of the dairy products. And again, in the 2022, we, we returned the status of net exporter due to the uh, European export. But, but when the 8 million people uh, will come back home, probably we will need again to back to the net importer model just to grow for the some period while the milk production will increase and grow. And yes, um, despite all the difficulties, the farmers who were able to continue their work, they, they end this year with a profit. And most, this, this was the, the result of the reason I already mentioned, but also in, in side price, internal price uh, wasn't decreased through this year, and it helps farmers to get profit. And also I should um, shortly demonstrate or shortly give you a, a, a view of Ukrainian farm structure, whereas we have dual dual production system where industrial farms uh, exist alongside households and for 20 years households is decreasing the milk production in Ukraine and the industrial farm of Ukraine it's a farm starts from 1000 hectares and an average size 350 cows they they showed a, a great competitiveness and profitability and the more or less stable milk production. And analyzing the six months of this year, we, we, sh we, 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 sh we saw that the, the milk production increased in industrial farms, and we hope that they will, they will return to the pre-war level the next year. So with these trends, we, our assuming is minus 4% of milk production for the 2023, but we must not forget that this is if nothing if if never, there is not a big changes in the war yeah but uh, yes and the one point that the industrial farms before the war they demonstrated a high level of social responsibility and during the war they increase the, they maximize this uh, this mission, yeah. And I have to mention that really agricultural enterprises in Ukraine during the war and especially dairy farmers became invincible points for the local communities because as long as they could, they were supplying for free grains, cereals, milk, meat to the communities in need around them, to the army, to the hospitals, to the kindergartens. They were the first uh, to start supplying the army with uh, long shelf uh, products within first month of war. And even those under occupation, they managed to start 
some simple pr processing to make butter, cheese and so on to supply their communities, civilians, people in need around them who were blocked, who had no possibility to, to survive with food. And one more uh, point to just to underline and to for you and to understand uh, what was going on. First months of the war, Kiev was almost sur surrounded by Russians. And there was a high risk that uh, hundreds of thousands of people inside Kiev would be blocked and would starvate. That's why Ukrainian agr agrarians were those who rushed to Kiev with hundreds of uh, wagon loads of grain, vegetables for free to pack Kiev with f enough food not to let uh, it to collapse. And the same activities were led in other regions, in biggest cities. So agrarian sector, farmers and dairy farmers, uh, most of all, are the um, backbone of our defense and our, well, sportive. resistance. Resistance, right. But at the same time, these are the, this, the same farmers that need our urgent support with information analytical support, legal advice, with humanitarian support for those that were under occupation for several months and lost all the possibilities of proper uh, conducting their business. That's why, as Association Milk Producers, together with other agricultural associations, Ukrainian Agricultural Council, Association of Pig Producers of Ukraine, we have received from our Minister of Agriculture the approval to be uh, responsible for attracting, taking to Ukraine and distributing to those farms in need humanitarian support. We managed within the first uh, months of war and after one year of war to supply humanitarian um, critical inputs like veterinarian, medicine, instruments, vaccines, antibiotics, uh, uh, milk and hygiene aids, uh, feeds and so on and so forth to more than 300 dairy farms all uh, around affected regions. But you can understand that after nine, ten months of no possibility to work properly at all, with so many fields mined, them still need huge support to survive to support their communities and people around them, and to have a chance to recover. So we are come to the conclusions, but this, the, key, the key notes uh, were based on the situation uh, that exists now, but we don't know, knowing our enemy, we don't know what could happen in every second or every minute. So Ukraine continue to produce agricultural commodities, ensuring national and global food security. We, our sowing campaign is over and we expecting the yield this year of 45 million tons, it's, but it's not included the damages of the dam destroyed. Ex export will be very important for Ukrainian economy and not only, export will be very vital for the countries of Africa and Asia that rely on our exports. Dairy farmers and, pro and processors, they proved the incredible resilience du during the war. They, they were a part of resistance and they do their work on their economic front. And also the, the, the dairy farmers, they showed incredible resilience in, in securing the local population. They, they extended their, their production function, function to the supporting, to the social support of the local population and army. And still, despite the war, Ukraine remains one of the most promising and attractive spots for investment into agriculture. Worldwide Bank uh, have conducted several years uh, investigation about, uh, as to the most promising and the most favorable spots at the map of the world for investment into effective, high-scale and uh, large farming and processing uh, in the world. And 2020, they have revealed the result of that report. Ukraine was in top countries among the world due to uh, enough land, enough water, enough labor resources, closeness to those deficit regions uh, of the world that need more supply of milk and dairy products and so on. And despite the war, World Wide Bank does not lower the rank of Ukraine in that list, and they do not cancel any plans of theirs as to investment into um, effective dairy product projects in Ukraine. 
For Ukraine, it means, and for, the, for Europe, for the world, it means that we are ready and open for joint projects together with European countries or world countries that have now limited possibilities for expanding and high-scale production of milk. At the moment, we are already uh, getting prepared to the recovery. We are working on a Marshall Plan for our agricultural sector and for dairy sector. And dairy farming and dairy processing in of top interest and top attention of our Office of President as that branch that will produce the most number of jobs, the most attractiveness for people to come back to Ukraine, and is most responsible for social stability and recovery of our regions. With this, we will thank you for attention, and I know you have many questions, but it's not possible in 20 minutes to, to highlight all the points and all the challenges we meet if we can do it on the session or, or after in the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Olga and Hannah, for the data and transparency. I think it's very important to share that message across all the countries and across all of your organizations to show that you know Ukraine is fighting and Ukraine is developing forward the agriculture. I think important towards also our topic is that we see how important is dairy and how important is agriculture for social uh, reason, for food security. And yeah, it's one of the tools in reality to help people in the country. So thank you for your fantastic story. Uh, if you will have questions, please ask Hannah and Olga during the day. Uh, we will also have shortly, a short panel later on, so if there will be any questions, please. Thank you very much. Good. So we covered the sustainability part. We have a fantastic story on the food security. And I think let's move to the last presentation of this part, which will be presented by one of our board member, Ernesto Reyes, uh, who will talk about the developing regions and projects to move dairy forward. So Ernesto, please. Thank you, uh, Lucas. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. After this professional and emotional journey that we have had with Ukraine, now let's move to another journey, which is the developing regions that we call now emerging economies. And, 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 and let's try to answer the question, if in those regions there is an option for, 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 for developing regions. And the, the idea of this is to tell you the work that we have been doing during the last seven years, working in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America for different organizations and, and showing what are the options that these regions may have in this global context that we have. And the idea is that we will first go to the, what is the evidence, scientific-based evidence is telling us about that future. We will also see what are these regions, what is the new normality for these regions, and we will see some daily economic trends there and the new sustainability model. This is how are we planning to cover. But let's start, set up the challenge that we have. In the future, up to 2050, 50% 50 of the global population growth will be in Africa and 41% will be in Asia, and 7% will be in Latin America. So how are we going to produce the food that these regions will need in the future? Because it's the, it is the real demand driver that is moving all these economies, and we will need to cope with this. So let's start trying to answer setting up this challenge. What is the scientific evidence telling us? I'm going to show the, the project that we have been working with GDP, FIO, International Fund for Agricultural Development, the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, and IFCN. We have come from a group, a team, working in those elements. We have selected the famous SDGs and the social ones, no poverty, no hunger, gender equality, and decent work and economic growth. We have produced a set of reports, 
And we have been doing revising the scientific literature review during the last 25 years. And we have two exclusions for articles. We were only selecting journal articles that they have statistical analysis and control groups, daily and not daily. We set up a journal reviewers and an editor totally out of the daily sector, neutral people. We were always having external reviewers to really have a science-based evidence of the daily sector in relation to these social uh, components. I will just to map. Yes, we have found a strong correlation in all the studies that dairy makes a significant contribution to poverty reductions, more income, more employment, better nutrition, better education, better health. It has been a strong correlation that can be uh, demonstrated. Second, at the end, dairy is associated with improved child linear growth and reduced stunting. This is one of the big, big findings we have been able to set up. The third element, in general, women perceive the impact on dairy in their lives as positive. Here we have hands-on issues because most of the studies in gender is qualitative studies, and we were looking for quantitative studies. We are expecting similar findings. We are working in the next report with employment generation. So this has the evidence base has been telling us. Then we have built building a database with 187 countries, which is the largest agricultural sector database during the last four years, assessing the linkages between dairy sector development and social development. We will produce a global dairy impact report that will be released soon. Let's see what are the results out of this data set. We have created four social domains, farmers' livelihoods, employment, consumer benefits, and the government revenue. Behind this, we have said, we have assumed, as long as the daily sector develops, and you will see these graphs. In the horizontal axis, you have daily sector development, which is measured by milk yield per cow per year. So the assumption here is that the more you produce, the, sec the daily sector develops, assuming that these yields are related to efficiency, working conditions, technology, and so on. And you see the shape of these lines. Let's start with the first one. As long as the daily sector develops, the farmer's income, income is improved. Important finding. Second, remember, each dot represents a country. Second, as long as the daily sector develops, people are going out of poverty, and they are building up resilience out of that. And this is the poverty line. And we have used the national poverty line for each country. We didn't use the international poverty line, which is $2.2. No, we have, according to the each country. Third findings, as long as the daily sector develops, more employments are generated until one point in which you can find efficiency ratios, and then it's going a little bit down. Fourth, in the daily industry, as long as the daily sector develops, better wages are paid. So more income for employee, employees. And the golden finding out of this study is that as long as the daily sector develops, people have better access to high-value nutrients in the daily products. But not only this, as long as the daily sector develops, there are more affordable prices to high-value nutrients cheaper prices for milk, affordability and accessibility. This has been the golden rule, because remember that our main role is to provide health and, and, and nutrients to the global population. And finally, with the government's revenue, obviously, and as long as the daily sector development is, is you have a potential tax-based. But the most important thing that, that we have been using for policymakers is that if you measure the agricultural GDP and the daily sector GDP within that line, within that graph, this shows, the shape of this line shows that the daily sector grows faster than the average agricultural sector in these developing regions. So these are the major findings, and you will see that, in, that we will public available publications. 
So, the question is the question is if there is an option for developing regions, I think from the science-based point of view, we have been able to reply. But then we went to different regions. Uh, we can use the, 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 the famous Torsten slide of one cow. Uh, this is one cow farm in Tanzania. And then the next farm we had to visit was the six cow farm. And it's very clear the difference. But let's assume a more academic reply to these questions. Society is expected to benefit from the daily sector, whose growth and transformation contribute to achieve the social SDGs. No poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, and decent and economic growth. So this is something that we should be proud of. And again, the team that has have been doing this is an totally independently from, from, from the daily sector. They have the commitment that we have to publish any finding, even if we don't agree with the finding. It has been a very, very neutral approach. So this, we have replied the question. But now let's move to a more practical approach. What is the new normality in daily? What are these regions are facing the issues in the next couple of years? First, we have been focusing too much in, 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 in emissions. This is what the expert call the carbon tunnel vision. But now there are more associated problems with environmental issues. And you can see here, animal welfare is a big, big worry for the daily sector and for the, for the social uh, implication of this. Education, health, ecotoxicity, now there is one after the COVID, there is one uh, ecosystem health is now a new, a new issue that is, that is. So the first conclusion out of that is that now we should take care of more issues, not only the carbon ones. And secondly, there is a new concept that is coming, which is sustainable food systems. This is the, the, the outcome of the E-Lancet report when they were recommending sustainable diets. And now they are going back through the value chain and are implying sustainable food systems. This is the new trend. We have been able to participate was two weeks ago. I have been involved in the e-consultation for the new report. And we were just trying this evidence to this Lancet report, because it's important that we have a very, very proactive role in this kind of expert roles, people saying what we must eat and from where. What else? Social acceptance to operate certain business. This is a picture of the largest a protest to operate the largest dairy farm in Europe is in Spain, and the cartels say, not in your town, not in my town. And we need to deal with, and, and the major of this town were really happy because employment was going to grow. But the people say, no, we don't want this. So this is what we call the social acceptance of the business. It's not, not anymore linked to, to, you can defend, <sighs> Academically, by research emissions, you can defend some things, even animal welfare. But this one is the, has an ethical implication of what do you want as a society. And you have four different steps. And let's produce an example of this. This concept has, has born in mining extraction. Uh, international corporations extracting natural resources. Mining was in which this element was being built. Let's give you another example that is very well perceived. Sustainable tourism is in Costa Rica. It's something that is very well accepted by the society, by the, by the customers of these services, because they are, they are somehow engaged to a sustainable way. The top one, handicraft, some minority, women, driver. There are a lot of elements that can, you as a, as a member of society can be linked to. 
But now the question to you all is, where are we located? Let's start with pigs and poultry. In the limits. Remember that in Spain some months, uh, one year and a half ago, we had an issue with a pig farm that someone from NGOs came into the farm as an employee and was filming in a record, was recording some conditions of the pigs. And they were using the hospital unit, not the, the production one. And because of that, and the next week, they have lost the, the Dutch market and pigs. This is something that we need to think about it. Beef is also, woof. when you think it's a, it, 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 beef is also in, in these limits, and I don't know where we can locate it with dairy, but what is worrying really is that consuming is an ethical decision. And nowadays, is, this is more stronger than before. So this is how this has been affected. This is part of the new normality. But now there are new influencers and new decision makers out of this. You remember that we have been discussing during the last 15 years that retailers has the power? Not anymore. The power is now in other hands. You have three kinds of influencers, consumers, investors, who would like to invest in the dairy sector if the dairy sector is associated with a risk. We, need, we should be aware of this. And regulations. Just have a look. The EU policy, where it's going. It is very clear. And the, the, the US policy is also moving in that direction. This is the new normality. 60% of the EU consumers consider product health, sustainability, and animal welfare when they make a, when they buy things at the supermarket. An investor, this has been a work that has been done by McKenzie Company during the last two years, interviewing people and what they think. And investors, they have realized that there is a risk between dairy and environmental implications. Consumers in the US, recently this work has been done two months ago. Almost 60% of the people, they think that they can make a difference when they choose, when they make a choice. 44% think that they can be an example of the choices they do to illustrate to the other members of the society what they have done. And 42%, they say, I am prepared to invest my money in the products that I strongly believe. They are healthy, they are environmental friendly, and so on. This is something really important. The pressure is coming from everywhere. Now there is a clear, a clear message from retailers. We have been recently in a marketing and communication strategy of the top 20 dairy companies in the world, and we were sitting down with the retailers, and the retailers were very clear. We will increase the environmental scrutiny of this. We will increase that. We would like to send clear messages. And then we have the nutritional score, you know the now the A, B, C, D scored in the products. Now they are looking for environmental score. So there are things that we should be aware in the future. I will finish this section that sustainability without performance has no impact. Performance without sustainability has no future. This is the CEO of Danone that they have found a huge opportunity in the sustainability element for their company. So they are really thinking this is a strategy. Now let's move to the daily economic trends in emerging regions. I would really like to make a, 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 a really here to stress that there are a few things that we should consider. The non-OECD countries are gaining more and more importance in terms of GDP in the, in the, in, in, 
in the last 20 years. So there are new players on these. There are not anymore the importance of the OECD countries. Second, if you see the annual growth of the GDP for the next 30 years, these are the countries that are on the top. So remember, population growth, Africa and Asia and Latin America, and look at the annual GDP. So the geostrategic, geostrategic and policy now is moving to another region, and we should be aware of this. We know the policy, reduce inventories in Europe, and how this will be the movement of this transformation. We have here change in inventories and change in yield, but the OECD calculations for the future. So, this is something that we have been doing. We have been doing long, short, mid, and long-term viability of the farms. This is in Africa. We have been measuring the, the baselines and the future fund models that the regions have done with us. We have been measuring profit, short-term, long-term, opportunity cost, operating cost, return to labor, recovery, family living cost, and capital. Because we would like to see how they perceive. And I delete on purpose the number of cows. Because I don't mind which, with the number of cows you do this. But I wanted to illustrate that it's in Africa, in several regions we have been, they consider that from 12,000 kilograms of milk per year is the critical franchise. Doesn't mind if you reach this with, with 12 cows producing 1,000. But they think they need the critical size will be 12,000 in Africa. If we move to Latin America, they believe the work we have been doing in, in, in Peru, the work that we have been doing in Colombia and in other regions, they think that from 25,000, they will be able to be viable in economic terms for the future. In, sorry, was it in Asia? In Africa, in, in Latin America, that we have more case studies, they are, they are thinking this, from 32,000 onwards. So a critical question that we should answer is, what is the critical farm size? In regions where the majority of the farm are subsistence farms. So which will be the critical? This is our decision in that regions, for Latin America, for Africa, and Asia. Remember, they have, we have been only moderating this analysis. But with, we have been having workshops with the stakeholders in that regions, and they have said, these are the critical franchises. So, after six years of visiting that regions and making that analysis, I would really like to be focused on what can we do in practical terms. The key, key driver, access to land. John, this is the, the real issue we need to bear in mind for the future. Land opportunity cost. We went to Peru, Cajamarca, in which a one hectare cost $80,000. Why? Because it's a gold mining. Opportunity cost, the highest. Why? Because all the people, we like to work in mining. And this is the, the largest daily region in Peru, which are number of farm size of two cows. Second, definitely, all the people that are sitting down here, please, we need to provide services in quality and quantity, people having access in those regions to feed stops and services. Quality and quantity, efficiency ratios, we will need to go back to the learning process of sustainable rotations, paddocks, sub-paddocks, and and all the elements associated with this. And we need to balance forages and concentrates because, because of the cash flow drivers, they buy concentrates as much as they can. But they need to be efficient first in, 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 in producing feed. Labor opportunity cost. 
labor competition, daily income, minimum wage, family living cost are elements that we need to compare with. And finally, access to globe to formal markets. This is something really important. Remember, 85, between 85 and 90 percent of those regions, especially in Asia and Africa, they deliver to informal markets. Latin America is different, but this is something really, really important to consider. And now let's go for the model, for the reply. I will end it up here, but let's go for the, how can we do this? It's very clear. We, as a humankind, and the nature we were interacting, the livestock, since many, many centuries. And we have used natural resources, land, water, nutrients, energy, genetics. And we have been able to produce tractions, fertilizers, food, fuel, leather, fibers. This is the interaction. But link it to this, we have socioeconomic services, growth, poverty alleviation, employment, health, nutrition, equity, landscape. Remember that most of the countries in the world have been doing something, the most important decision when they have done the land reforms, giving the land to the people. But it has environmental implications. Climate, nutrients, oceans and waters, biodiversity and conservation. Now we are involved in a big project which only is focused on biodiversity and livestock because biodiversity is a measurement of ecosystem health. Again, growth demand, climate change, and competition and scarcity. So let's start with the solution. I think our biggest role is here. Increase natural resource use efficiency. This is our biggest role. But we need to bear in mind where we are. If we are in the Amazonian regions, we cannot increase the natural resource use efficiency as we can, because we need to protect and increase critical resources. Independence when you are located. But also you have to balance human needs. You cannot be sit down in the, in the northern European countries, and sorry for this, uh, Anders, in a desk in Denmark or in Sweden, and to write down that everybody should decrease milk consumption and should increase plant-based food. Because you need to bear in mind in which regions are you, how many people are going to be, depending on these elements of, of, of the daily sector in this case. Fourth, we need to manage the risk and build in resilience because every time we know the weather condition is, is, is getting worse and worse and we need to prepare those regions. And the most important one, which is a clear message to the daily industry as a whole, is that we need to develop governability and institutional capacity. Without this, it's impossible. <sighs> we have been checking the te top 10 successful daily projects in the world. And all of them has one key success factor, public-private alliances. This is a very, very key. Our friend from, from South Africa was remarking the role of daily and the role of government provided road infrastructure. This is a key element on this. And we cannot charge the road infrastructure to the dairy farmers. It's a, it's a, it's a political implication for the country. Having said that, I will finish here. Thank you very much, and we yes. will take it. Thank you, Ernesto, for closing the picture. I think we tackled many aspects as a point of about affordability, you know, and how to develop emerging regions. I think where yeah, dairy can bring a lot of value. And I think, you know, now will be good time to have a short panel. Sorry, it's my role, I'm as a moderator. We have fantastic topics, but of course, it's always cutting the time. So I will, 
would like to invite once again Eric to the stage, Philip and all the panelists, and all the speakers. Uh, please take a seat. We will run currently the panel. It will be for around 20 minutes. Later on, we will like to invite you for the lunch. So I will also try to encourage our moderators for the panel that, you know, if we could also have more questions later this evening, because we are still here, use the time. Yes, thank you very much, guys, please. After such impressive presentations, there's two ways forward. Either we as, say, forum leaders can uh, start off with a question, but it's probably much more interesting for you if you have a burning question here in the audience to one or more of the panelists to, um, to start with your questions. Who? within the audience would like to raise the first question. So thank you very much for the amazing presentations. And I'm gonna, my question is to Ernesto. I think you, you, had, you knew this is coming. Uh, impressive data, and I just a couple data points I'd like to ha have clarified. Yes, sustainability is important, but our data, that we, we look at is showing that consumers are not willing as much to pay for sustainability. So sustainability, yes, as long as the price is the same. Uh, I'm very impressed by the data that you have from, the, from, from Africa and Latin America. 12,000 uh, kilograms or liters, I don't know what the units are, for a farm to be profitable in Africa, knowing, like you said, you know, some countries 70, 80% are smallholders, smallholders one to five cows, I mean, what's the journey from one to five cows to get to 12,000 12, liters to be profitable? If they cannot get there, should they look somewhere else and not there is an option? Thanks. No, it's the, same, the question was very simple to the stakeholders, government, farmers, advisors, was very simple. How do you consider what is the critical farm size, and let's model these critical farm size together. A farm that are able to pay labor, a farm that is able to produce for the family harm consumption, a farm that is able to retain youngers, and a farm that compete with minimum wages. And the result was 12,000. Obviously, we have been now working, and we are now working, and how can you make that shift from two cows farm to 12 or to 10 cows? But it's the next step. And, and this is out of the record now. How can we say the out of the record? But subsistence farming is really important. But for the food security of the future, we need to seriously think on the critical farm size. Obviously, we still have the doubt. When we do these exercises, we still have the doubt. Because, you know, as a dairy expert, you say, ah, you have to go to specializations. You have to reduce intercropping. No more beans, no more maize. Now you have to produce milk. But then, if you really look at the, at the implication of the maize and the beans for the family, how consumption is really important. For me, the key answer here, and I have to say as a summary, dairy is profitable. They can grow, but the issue is land access. Land access is the issue. One conclusion that seems to materialize when you review and reflect on the presentations of this morning is that global supply chains of dairy will fundamentally change over time. And I'd like to invite all of you to reflect on that. Who is going to feed the world in 2030 
knowing the different priorities that the traditional exporters, Europe and New Zealand, are setting? Yeah, I, I guess it comes down to um, if we can't, if the demand is growing, uh, you know, uh, continues to grow, and we cannot meet that growth from New Zealand, someone else may fill that gap. If they cannot fill that gap, then we're going to have a, a shortage for sure, which will mean prices will go up, people will look for substitution, and things will rebalance. So there will definitely be quite an alteration coming in, in future decades around the whole supply chain uh, and how it operates, definitely. Yeah, I support the previous speaker that for sure within next few decades we will see uh, immense changes to uh, the dairy map of the world. And of course because of those old challenges and uh, demands to the dairy producers, with the increasing demand uh, for dairy products that IFC and team has already proven us there will be, but at the same time with the uh, obstacles and limited possibilities for traditional old school, let us call, uh, top producers of milk to fulfill or to come up with all those demands. That's why for sure we will see new players of this dairy league, thanks to Philip, we already have uh, that uh, connotation. And uh, I think that uh, really uh, the central part of Europe and those countries that will provide the enough access to land and to water as one of the limiting factors will be those that would be major players. But of course, um, labor, no matter we have a lot of automation possibilities, robotization possibilities and so on, but intellectual possibilities and resources will be of uh, also limiting factor. So I hope that among those spots on the dairy map, there will be for sure Ukraine, because we are able due to our land resources and water resources to double uh, their traditional levels of uh, milk production traditionally before all those transformations and obstacles connected with the war and uh, previously with COVID and after that with the war and hostilities, we uh, produced about 10 million tons of milk per year. So we are able, using our uh, res existing resources, to double this. But I believe that also um, Northern America and some other European countries, taking into consideration the natural resources, will also be able to come up with uh, this new structure of the dairy world. I just would like to add that uh, 30 years ago in Ukraine was 8 million cows. I think in, in, in those developing regions, we need to first reallocate the animals. There are some regions that they shouldn't have been in dairy. I mean, if you milk cows in the Amazon, Amazonian basin, you need to declare national parks. I mean, this is, uh, this is a real truth, but what are the social implications of these are the main thing. But instead of that, if you go to regions like Tanzania, for example, when you have enough land and access to natural resources, but 90% of the farms are one cow farm in the backyard, who is owning the land and how this land is will be used. It's, so reallocation is a key element of this for access to natural resources are the main element for those regions. Maybe to, to add there also and to refer again to, to what I was saying earlier, I think there is great opportunity still and I think Argentina can, Leonie Messi, they just need to, Leonie Messi is the best exercise or the best thing to refer to. So I think he was starting young, Argentina has the potential, he was coming to Europe, was growing, now he's going to the US, so I think Derry can also learn something like this and should have some good examples and maybe referring also to something like this. Or oh, Brazil with Pelé. So I think there's more where we can refer and maybe also make some connections. Talking about connections, we've got representatives from all over the world in this room. And it's great that we are within our wonderful white dairy bubble, but we all have our stakeholders 
when you return next week to your various offices. We may now have developed insights. How can we pass on those insights and get them accepted as us being ambassadors for what needs to be done? Now, my question to the panelists and a little bit also to the floor would be, what do you need to know in the next years that IFCN can help you provide with in order to be as effective a dairy ambassador for dairy development and growth globally to feed the world that IFCN can help you with? What do you need to know? I think the IFCN has a huge opportunity here and we're talking about a changing world and we're talking about all these um, challenges that we're going to face and we are facing. And I think by sharing our knowledge together, by coming up with examples of things that are happening and, and working, success stories, and to really promote and tell the good stories of dairying to the rest of the world, we can make a difference. And our core has been to use strong, um, real uh, data to do that. And I think if we can continue to do that, but perhaps extend our breadth a little bit into the sustainability area, I think we can make a huge difference for daring. Yeah, I would also support that, that we really need good stories of success to get inspired. And uh, uh, I have heard a lot from uh, the audience who were on the first days of the conference, but unfortunately I was not lucky to visit those farms, that there were some examples that should be shared worldwide. Uh, and uh, at the same time, when we are talking about uh, the main messages for our stakeholders, and uh, how IUCN team can support uh, in fulfilling those challenges. For sure, next years will bring us those tasks that we have never faced before. Nobody have faced before. Uh, and that's why we'll need more investigation into those ways of sustainability and keeping balance in that triangle of affordability, security, and sustainability. What is the, the best algorithm for our dairy farmers taking into consideration uh, their location, their national peculiarities? Uh, and also one more important thing is keeping closer as a dairy community, so we would also need to know who we can rely on, who we can come, come into a joint or common a collaboration and projects together, because uh, no matter we uh, were t talking about uh, future development of dairy sector during the first day of the conference, and we were doubting whether we will see further globalization or further um, localization, but I believe that still global aspect will pay a lot the immense role, and for those farmers that wo uh, will have, or those industries that will have limited abilities to develop, to expand, and to be sustainable and effective, partners in other parts of the world would be the answer, could be the answer to this uh, uh, difficult task. Uh, if we're talking about uh, success story, uh, I would like to share with you the, the latest project, uh, which I started in Ukraine. Um, you may know that uh, greenest energy, uh, it's uh, energy which farmers doesn't use at all. And uh, this is why uh, I start to thank uh, Hanna, uh, we start to uh, promote how to possible to reduce your energy, uh, reduce your cost. Uh, sorry? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, there is, a, for example, in uh, Netherlands, uh, Dutch farmers know uh, how to use uh, pre-cooler, how to use recuperator in your cooling equipment, uh, how to use uh, variable vacuum pump, uh, and etc. Uh, lights. Uh, and uh, we uh, publish in a magazine, in uh, milk and uh, dairy magazine uh, in Ukraine, uh, all this uh, opportunity which is, uh, can reduce your bill 20, 30, up to 50%. So the... Solution have 
Sometimes solution is really on the on the bottom. So you just uh, need to uh, take and use. Uh, just uh, j just same with the mixers. Uh, for example, Triolet they have a Shiftronic, which is use uh, less uh, fuel to, to prepare feed, etc., etc. Yeah, maybe oh, maybe yeah. Ernesto, having also a look on the time. One sentence. Manageable? Well, uh, uh, I would be very biased because of the job that I do. But we need to make more case studies and, and we need to increase our methodological approach with sustainability factors considering this. And one final clarification, the future farm types we have setting up in the regions, they do exist. So it's in reality, this happening, this is happening, they do exist. This is not something that we have invented. They do exist. So successful case studies in that sense, they do exist. Perfect. John, before we are coming to your question, Gerta, are there any online questions? Okay. So, John? It, it, it's more a comment, um, bearing in mind that the time's running out. Um, you, you asked what IOCN could do, uh, I think, Eric. And I think that the work and what Ernesto is doing is probably more important than many of us fully appreciate with the global dairy platform and supporting that activity with lobbying at a global level. And I think you can see that in terms of moving the dial with the, with the FAO and what they've done. And I think in terms of what I personally think IFCM we'd like to do is to support Torsten uh, with his profile and what Torsten is doing, because he's going to carry on, in actually doing far more in that arena, because that gives us the entitlement with the license to operate and to be able to grow and feed the world. And I think that, in my world, is, is one of the key things. Brilliant morning, some fantastic presentations, and thank you very much. Yeah, is there any other burning question? Anders. Thank you. It's difficult to summarize this, but I think what we in IFCN should be doing, and that's what you are indicating as well, John, that is to use the knowledge we have and to inform the public, because we are today meeting a lot of um, different opinions that are not fully science-based, and they are creating additional complications for us. There are enough problems for the dairy industry and feeding the world. So let us use our knowledge to spread the information and make decisions made on scientifically-based evidence rather than a lot of conceptions and wild ideas. So there's a lot of work in front of us in that sector as well in IFCN. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you, Anders. And I think this is also a good transition to the next point in the agenda, because without food and without full stomach, we <laughs> will not make the right decision. So I will invite you now for a one hour lunch break, and then we will meet here at uh, 2.15 again. Thank you.
keep it quite short, okay? <laughs> Hello, hello. Everybody had a good l lunch break? Yeah. Great. Okay, so I would like you all to get seated that we can start with the afternoon session, which is, as you can see, the farm session. And what I would want to do is directly jump into the first presentation. And I want to welcome Dorothy on stage. For those of you who don't, do not know Dorothy, she is the longest member in IFCN, not counting Torsten in. So Dorothy, please come up. The stage is all yours. <laughs> okay, so I'm not the tallest, I'm not the biggest, but I'm the one having been with ICN for the longest, apart from Torsten. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you all had a good lunch, you're not too tired, and we are ready for some new, well, food for thought maybe. So, as you remember, the topic of this conference is energy crisis in um, dairy, and um, well, you see on the title it says energy and feed management on the farms, and it says yearbox results. So our yearbox is something very special, and I'm going to talk and tell you what it is in a minute, and then uh, show you the results. But what we decided, because we have a few new people in the audience today, and because some of you said we had a lot to take up yesterday, we do a very, very recap what we said yesterday about the farm economics. So a very short summary, and then we go into the two parts of our topic. We talk about energy and we talk about feeding on dairy farms. So first of all, just for you to remember, the orange countries are the ones participating in the farm co comparison. The black dots are the locations where the farms are, more or less, if it was possible and the country was big enough. So basically, we have got these 54 countries participating and splitting up in 66 regions, and then 172 farms participating in our analysis. So thanks for that. So this was the highlight chart of the conference, maybe. It's the uh, positive change in the milk prices. These, again, are the farm data, so we show the change in milk price on our average-sized farms in these 54 countries. And the first impression is the map is green. And green means positive, and green means the milk price has increased from the previous year to the last one. And it's even dark green in some parts of the world, which means that the milk price has, has actually increased by more than 10 US dollars per 100 kilograms of milk. So this is really, really great. We have a few countries where we do not see an increase in milk price, but there are not a lot of them. So if this looks so bright, if we have such a positive change in milk yield, you would expect that the farmers would jump up and down and be really, really happy about it. But this is one question that we ask our partners, how is the mood in the among the farmers in your country? Well, we show you the results in 2022 and 2023, and well, this bubble chart more or less looks the same. So most of the farmers, more than half, are still only in a moderately good mood. Some are positively engaged and well, still, well, a quarter to a third are in a negative mood. So how does that come? We have record high milk prices, we have got good profits, 
but still the dairy farmers are not too happy, they are just careful. Well, and this might be one, one of the answers for, for our farms. Why don't we have production growth? Why aren't the farmers in a very po positive mood? Well, first of all, they are not stupid, they've got experience, and they know that these high milk prices that we enjoyed would, not, would only be, be short-lived. So it was not a long-lasting joy uh, we would have. Then there was a lot of in insecurity running, uh, going around at the moment. So it's about the economic situation, the world situation, the political conditions as such uh, in the short and long term. And we had some very sad examples this morning. And finally, farmers at this stage, they are going more for, um, for safety. So they rather go for financial uh, consolidation at farm level and they rather improve the current system, make it more improve the work-life balance, do a little bit of investment to get better machinery, but not investing in growth, but just investing in better working conditions on, on their farm. So this is a, the um, situation at the moment. So again, summarizing up what we found out regarding farm economics, there's a chance for farmers because they enjoyed um, a higher income than, than in, in the previous years, so they have some money to, to spend and enjoy. But there's also a change, you know, we are, all, we are always looking at the competitiveness around the world, and this is also determined by the exchange rate, and many countries change the devaluation, or the national currency changed the devaluation against the US dollars, and this was especially for Europe, um, an advantage, so they gained actually in, in competitiveness, so this is something new and good for us over here in Europe, in Europe. And as I said before, we do have a challenge here, of farmers see a challenge, so they are careful and they see challenges, problems coming up, and that's why they are a little bit careful. Okay, so this was a short summary that we are all on the same level again. Now I turn to this gearbox. So, what is the so-called yearbox? Well, first of all, we design a set of questions which we send to our partners to answer. It's a different set of questions every year, and usually it has something to do with the topic of the conference. So, this year it will be something about feeding and energy management. And then the questions can either refer to country or farm level, and there you see the numbers of our partners participating this year. So we are really grateful that you, are, that you take your time and answer these uh, questions. So maybe just to sum up, well, the Yearbox is a tool. It offers the unique chance to get some insights on a very specific topic and on questions which are not always statistical questions. And of course, we get these insights from around the world. And as I mentioned before, we will talk about the topic of feed and energy management. So right now we go into the first part and we talk about energy, energy on farms. So our question was, how does the energy crisis affect dairy farms? Well, we heard this morning some just <laughs> um, said no, shake their head and said no, we don't have any sort of energy crisis, but indirectly we are all affected by the fertilizer prices. So on the left-hand side, you can see here, well, some said, no, we don't have any influence, but some said, well, either energy costs or fertilizer or both got, uh, went, went up. What does it mean? So moving over, well, if the costs go up, either you try to save or you don't use it anymore. So it did have an impact on the uh, fertilizer use on farm on quite a few farms. And if you don't use fertilizer or if you lose, uh, use less energy, it somehow has an effect on, on your production system. So either you adjust and change it a little bit, or it might be actually an incentive to produce renewable energy on farm yourself. And I think on Sunday visiting the second farmer especially, we had quite a good example for that. So. Do we see a permanent change in the setup of the dairy farms initiated by this current energy crisis situation? 
Well, talking about the renewable energy, is it a viable income source for farmers? Is it possible for a dairy farmer to produce actually renewable energy on farm? So green means yes for most farms or for a lot of farms within the country. Um, yellow is indifferent or we didn't get an answer and red means no. So somehow you see a clear split. So the left side of the map is green, the right side of the map is red. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, you need a farming system which is actually fit for producing energy. So if you don't have a barn, you don't have a roof, it's difficult to put a solar panel on. Uh, if you have a grazing farm, you don't collect the slurry, so you cannot use it for making biogas and things like that. So it doesn't mean that the farmers would not like to do it or that the country as such would not like to produce renewable energy, but it's just that the dairy farming system is, might not be set up in a way that it's suitable for that. But on the other hand, we see a lot of farms and countries, so it's Europe and the Americas, where, where farms have really got the chance to produce renewable energy and might already be doing it. So here we see how many actually produce renewable energy. So it looks a little bit complicated, this thingy. So the bar at the bottom tells you, well, in 50% of the countries, none of the farms produces renewable energy. So those were all the red countries we've just been talking about. Then there are another 20% of our world re or countries and can country regions where only a very, very small number, so probably the most progressive and largest ones, produce re renewable energy. But on the other hand, we see that in some countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, more than 50% of the dairy farms already produce renewable energy. So it is possible, and those countries having a similar farming system to uh, Germany and the Netherlands, of course, could follow up on that if the conditions are right. And then there are a few countries starting with that, so at the UK and Austria, so there are 20 to 30 percent of the farms following. So I think there is a lot of potential going on and growing with renewable energies. So the potential is definitely there. But on the other hand, we also ask you, where does the electricity come from? Well, of course, the, of the obvious answer is most farms still get it from the grid. This is more than 90 percent, and if the grid doesn't work, you have got a generator uh, running around, well, running in the background, and this is probably, you see the countries where this is happening, so either because the electricity fails sometimes or it's just a, a sort of a safety measure in the background. But then also uh, biogas and windmills are picking up, and you see the countries over there. So it is becoming more and more well, common and it is possible to use your farm to produce different types of energy and use them on farm and to become a little bit more independent. So before the very content slide um, I showed you was that well, fertilizers get more expensive, uh, power, diesel gets more expensive, farms are well, the normal people, everybody is suffering, so, so are there any governmental regulations um, or new policies um, in order to support the farmers in this case? Well, obviously you can see that the number of answers differs a lot according to a country or to a world region, where we have a lot of countries in, West, in Western Europe, so there are more answers, but we also have more regulations in Western Europe, so this is another case. The blue one means at the bottom that no, there was nothing. So there are enough continents where, well, they were not affected or the government didn't care. But still, um, the most common reactions of the government was, well, either we put a maximum price level on. So power, one unit of energy was allowed, should only cost so and so much, or one power of gas, uh, one unit of gas should only cost that and that much. So either these maximum price levels were set in, or uh, subsidies were granted to the farmers or also to the general populations. So yes, it did happen, and the governments tried to support their population and their farmers um, in order to cope with these high prices where they did happen. So, but 
meaning suddenly getting high prices and being faced to have much higher costs than you anticipated before, it's also something about risk and risk management. So what do you do in order to improve the risk management on farms? So we ask you which sort of advice farmers were given. Well, the light yellow one, the light gray one at the left hand side is that no advice was given because either it was not possible or not necessary, so depending on that. But then the two red bars actually meant that farmers were given the advice to stop milking or reduce milking. So it does have an influence on the milk production and what we discussed this morning, how to improve the milk production. And you can see some of the countries there, so sometimes it goes into the opposite di direction and we are actually advised to decrease milk production and not to increase milk production. But then on the other hand, the three green bars, which are the most common ones, it has something to do with your production system and how, how you produce your milk. So um, looking at the feed ration, improving the feed ration, looking at the genetics, just gaining efficiency in order to cope with the situation. So this is probably, these are some standard answers which farmers are always given. But then looking at the right hand side, the dark gray parts is also, well, improving the management. So not looking just what's happened in the barn, but what, look, what happens in your uh, farm office. So looking at the contracts and so on. So you can also gain a lot of efficiency money sometimes when you talk with your bank manager or your feed supply company in order to get better conditions there. And again, renewable energy is one of the answer. Okay. Does it work? Okay. So just sum up this, um, these um, highlights on, or just uh, highlight our key facts on energy. So the high energy costs or energy shortages makes the farmers adjust to their production system. Uh, many governments try to support the farmers by putting maximum price levels or paying subsidies, granting subsidies. And renewable energies are suitable for production on oops, sorry, many farms and uh, yes, and we can just implement them. Okay, sorry for clicking here one, once too much. So right now, this was our energy part. Now the second was looking at feeding. It's also sort of managing some sort of energy on the farm. So the question was, how do you deal with high feed costs? And we sort of split the answers up according to the uh, world region. Well, and the most simple answer was, and the answer which was given most of the time, uh, try to have the same milk yield, but change your feed ration in order to make it work and concentrate on the home, homegrown feed. So these were the most common answers around the world and in most of the continents, um, home, homegrown feed and adjusting the feed ration was really, was really the way to go for. So here right now, we look a little bit at feed and feeding costs so that we get an idea how it looks like and how feed costs are actually distributed among the farms. So what I tried to do here, I selected five different farming types in order to show you the differences or the similarities among the different systems. So first of all, we have a, a, a farm from France, which is a common sort of standard system in Europe and also North America. We feed silage and concentrate. Um, Algeria is pretty special in that way that they do have a very low number of replacements on the farm. So they have a very low number of young stock on farm. Argentina and New Zealand are both grazing farms with the difference that Argentina is feeding concentrate and New Zealand is, is not necessarily. And in between we do have India, well, with a very long calving interval and a high age as first calving, so there are a lot of non-lactating animals on farm. So this is just that we see different farming or feeding systems. And right now, let's have a look, little bit a look at the um, results. On the left-hand side, you see the different sort of feed rations, how they are set up and how much feed goes where. But on the left-hand side, we have a look at the costs. 
And generally, some people say, well, we don't care about the feed costs for the young stock because it doesn't cost us anything to feed the young stock. And in a way, they are, they are right because some of the farms, they, the young stock only takes up two, between two and five or six percent of the, um, of the total feed costs. So most of it, 80 to 90 percent, goes to the lactating cows. So that's why it's so important to be efficient over there. And then India is, is quite interesting. This is really the country sticking out here. The lactating cows take only up like 70%, nearly 70%, because they have so much young stock, and the young stock are really a cost factor on, on farm. So on the other hand, it shows if we are good in fertility management, we can save costs. So this would be the, the conclusion the other way around. And then we look in more detail at the home, homegrown feed costs. We have never really did an analysis. We never really did an analysis on this. So here, you, again, the same uh, five farms. And you can see, well, it's remarkably stable. So the homegrown feed costs, they vary. Well, for a lot of farms, they are between 12 and 13 US dollars per 100 kilograms of uh, milk. And again, India sticks out because of the many young stock on farm and the average in our database was 14 US dollars. So I think this was quite interesting. I was not aware of that, I must admit. And then on the left hand side, we show you the increase in costs because we talked so much about inflation and increase in energy costs and all the sort of things. So what we calculated here is the increase in uh, feed costs from one year to the other and we did it in national currency, so not to have this USD exchange rate factor in there. Well, and you can see that the feed costs on farm actually increased between roughly 8% in the US and up to more or nearly 70% in Argentina because, well, the inflation rate uh, has a big uh, factor in there. And what we can also see is that in three of these countries, the increase in um, homegrown feed costs is higher than the inflation rate. And why that? Because, well, the energy costs, the fertilizer costs were above the national inflation rate. So we have seen overproportionately high increase in feed costs here. So homegrown feed is not necessarily cheap, but maybe the cheapest option that we have got. Coming from homegrown feed, right now we look at purchased feed, and not just purchased feed within the country, but imported purchased feed. And we asked how much dairy feed is imported into the country, and maybe the question was not quite clear because we were thinking of all the feed, including the uh, roughage. So most can't, well, the dark green part shows the countries where hardly any feed was imported because the country is big enough and so that's why it is self-sufficient. Self but then we see a lot of countries, the middle moderate green ones, where up to 20% um, up to, uh, of the feed is actually imported and that is quite often the protein, so the soya from the Americas or rapeseed or something like that. Only very few countries import really a lot, so China is a country probably which comes to mind when we look at importing even roughage. This is for, content, but this is for the total feed when we look at um, only compound feed, then Ireland, for example, is also a country uh, importing more than 50% of the concentrate feed in order to feed the cows. So there's a lot of dependency on the international markets here. Okay, what you feed in, in the front, comes out at the back. So we have uh, manure and, um, well, manure is sort of say a multi-purpose product and if those of us who had the chance to visit the, f the second farm on Sunday, well, he had a huge biogas plant, so all the slurry was going into the biogas plant producing energy, then the slurry was put into a, what is it called? Uh, well, it was split up into the liquid phase and into the solid phase. The liquid phase was spread on the field as fertilizer. The solid phase was used as bedding for the cows. So one product, the manure, and three different purposes and uses of that. So manure is a multi-purpose product. It's, it's not something to waste. 
it is precious, it has its cost, and it has its benefits, so make use of it. And probably there's also a lot to gain. So here we show you just a few countries um, which also use alternative uses than just using it as fertilizer. So there is something happening, and I think there is a lot more to gain and process on. So just quickly summarizing our key facts on feed. So obviously the high feed prices make the farmers adjust their feeding ration. Although the homegrown fodder production is getting more expensive, uh, it's just the way to go and to, to improve and uh, increase maybe even the home, homegrown feed production. And farmers should go and try for making full use and of their manure as this is a multi-purpose product, so to say. So if we summarize all this up, I came up with the question, do the last few years make the farmers try for more independence? And when visiting the farms on Sunday again, I was quite, whoops, this is it, because both farmers talked about to be independent. Both tried to produce as much energy as they needed on farm, and both tried to be completely in, in independent of importing feed or buying even feed, so purchasing feed. So I think those two farmers were really a good example for what we might go, we, we might be heading to. So there is an opportunity on the farms, they can produce energy and they should go for it, it's really a chance for them also and diversifying and making money from some other income sources than just milk and, uh, and cattle. And there's also a challenge going on because of the feed as the main input and also cost factor has to receive special attention right now and um, higher reliance on, on own fodder production makes the farmers more independent and it's probably, well, it could be a gain. So thank you for providing the data on the yearbox and I hope we got quite a nice overview of what is happening and yes. We know more than we did half an hour ago. Thank you. Thank you much, Dorothy, for the overview on energy and feed. We would like to now move forward. We prepared for you three case studies, and we will start with the UK. Yes. I would like to introduce you to John Allen. You know him very well. He's founder of the Kite Consulting in UK. So, John, the question will be how to monetize sustainability, eh? Please. Is that working? Thank you, Philip. Is that okay? Great, okay. Everybody hear me around the room? Good. Excellent, okay, right, let's just move on. Right, there we are, good. Um, just for one or two in the room who might not have heard me do the introduction to Kite on Saturday or don't know me or our business, I'll just do two, a, a short description of our business. Um, it was, as uh, Lukasha has said, we, we, we evolved from a state advisory run business that was privatized and that was a, a botch. Uh, and then we started our own business with 14 consultants in, uh, in uh, 2000. That actually evolved and became a specialist business along the dairy supply chain. Uh, and it evolved to have a, about 50 people in it, about 30 odd consultants in it over uh, a period of time up until now. And in terms of the work that we would do, then classically we will do farmer grower work, which will be um, the sort of thing that you do technically with farmers in terms of nutrition, rations, herd management, uh, business management work, financial management, succession, etc. That is our bedrock of our business, that gives us credibility. But also in the UK, then actually the uh, UK dairy industry was uh, 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 it had deregulation brought in in 1994. And what that did is it took away a monopoly with the milk marketing board and all the farmers had to go to find their own contracts with their own milk buyers or milk buyers had to find them. 
And in that world, then there was two responses that you could take. You could go, this is terrible, this is horrible, we should all stay in the co-op. Or you could embrace the change and see, well, how are we going to make the best use of it? And actually what happened is that we actually engaged with milk processors and with retailers, and they were considered by farmers to be the enemy. Uh, but we actually found that they really wanted to get to know farmers and understand them because they had a business to run as well. Uh, and actually that actually created another part to our business which has grown and evolved and I talked about it the other day which is the change management part of the business so that's about a third of our business a third is roughly farmer grow a third is uh, change management so that would we would run workshops programs talking to Rajesh about India yesterday over lunch then actually you would do all the same things and um, what we try to do is get farmers to farmers to listen to farmers uh, we're the experts in the room, we're not the people who tell, because farmers never listen to experts. They always listen to a farmer, all right, because the farmer has done it, he's practical, they don't understand that. And then the other part of our business is a sourcing business where we specialise performance products that actually help our clients and we get good value for our clients, and actually that goes into our business as well. So that's the third leg to our business. So that's our business, and as some of you will have picked up, and I talked about uh, yesterday on uh, Monday, then we were acquired by AB uh, in uh, December, and that was part of a grander strategy that we outlined, so I'm not going to go over all of that again, but I just wanted to explain that. So in a way, we are a sister business within the AB portfolio that's actually linked to, to IFCN. IFCN is a fantastic business because it's actually a reservoir of talent, uh, specialist knowledge, economics and understanding at an international level. Our business is a national uh, UK-based business, more in terms of consultancy, working along the supply chain. Just so you've got a picture, and we're obviously going to be hoping to work and work a lot more and create a lot more value together with our business, with the, the two businesses going forward. So, what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit in terms of something which we talked about at Ukulele, and I, I heard reference to it. Um, also, uh, one or two times during the last 24 hours. And it's about how do we actually recover valorization of sustainability. Now, that seems a very complex word. Uh, so I've called it monetize. How do we actually make it so that actually sustainability that we have to do increasingly as a license to operate, can we actually get a return from it? And how is that return going to possibly come from the market? So that's what I want to talk about now and, and, and just share with you and create some discussion. Because to be frank, this is not a done deal. This has not happened. This is still a work in progress. And I think it, it links to some of the things that we heard pre-lunch. And it links to some of this. Um, Eric Egglesmar is a fantastic colleague and partner of ours and has done some brilliant work in the U UK on thought leadership. And in terms of actually what one of the uh, pieces of work we did recently, we wanted to look in terms of where has dairy come from? Uh, and, and if I told you, you're in a business that for the last, what is it, 10 years, 12 years here, that you've got a compound uh, growth of actually aggregate uh, compound re return of 8.4% per annum. And that's on the basis, this is from, for export, uh, and that's into the export market or the importers. So that is the world that we're in. We're not in a declining industry. Now, it goes up and down, and that's over a long 12-year period. But if I told you as an investor that you were coming into an industry where you were getting that level of growth in terms of, com in terms of combination of actual 2.7% uh, annual compound growth we heard about in terms of growth, but also the valorization on top of it. So that product is increasingly being more valued. And that's what, that's what we've created, that's what you're entering, that's what the world is. So that's the history. And Eric did a brilliant piece of work with us. Uh, it, we called it Project Apollo. All these pieces of work are available on our website. And this was a means of actually trying to communicate with the Climate Change Committee in the UK, that we actually ha should retain a license to operate and a license for dairy to continue to grow. And it was based on the fact that actually dairy is fantastic in terms of sustainable nutrition. You've heard me say it before, but I'm going to say it again. Actually, in terms of a kilogram of carbon, you get more nutrients from a kilogram of milk than you do from any of the oats. 
So we've got something that is unique and very valuable. The chairman of the Climate Change Committee actually recognised what the UK dairy industry was doing in terms of meeting its sustainability goals on a journey and actually in terms of what it does to feed the world. And actually, although our official Climate Change Committee recommendation is that we should reduce uh, and animal meat, uh, sorry, meat uh, and dairy protein by 20%, that's because people like me eat too much of it, that actually is quite acceptable, but the UK can actually produce more dairy. That's official government policy in the UK. We c we're a home where they currently, they will accept that we will produce more dairy. They don't want to, our current government policy is not to constrict and reduce dairy production. We're doing it within constraints, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But that's a very important thing. Now, the point is, in that report, one of the things we pointed out is what, and it's too much stuff to go through, you'll have to take it on trust. You heard Eric earlier today, so please listen to the expert. But Eric ably demonstrated in the analysis, in the scenario, that we're increasingly not going to be producing enough dairy in the blue line, and that actually creates the red line, which is unsatisfied demand. Unsatisfied demand is not unsatisfied demand. It's a shortfall. And that's an economic, the markets will balance out. But the fundamentals say that looking forward, we potentially have got a market which is going to actually have untapped demand with rising prices. So that's what we've got. And we talked about the rationing issue earlier today, so I don't want to go over that rehearsed argument. Bearing in mind all these fundamentals, what I do want to talk about now is the challenges of meeting that market. And now this is just something uh, that we, uh, we do milk profiling work in the UK. So we work in an industry where dairy processors have very tight margins. An EBIT of about 3 to 4% would be considered quite acceptable. 1 to 2 is often the case. And actually, if you get your forecasting wrong in terms of milk flow, it can really damage your business. So it can take a third or half of your profit away from you. So it's very important to actually get your profiling right. So in terms of what we tried to do with some of the processes we've looked at, and I hasten to add, this is a failed project, uh, right? It works in the short run. It does not work in the long run, okay? So what they wanted to do is try to say, oh, well, can we actually, uh, you know, factor in all the things using clever things like artificial intelligence to use algorithms to tell us what's going to happen to dairy milk flows over the next five years? Uh, and, and in terms of what we did, that we actually looked at all the drivers in the UK that we've been talking about that are going to impact on milk flows. So we got BPS changes, we got subsidies being taken away, we've got the Clean Air Act and the, and the water regs, which I'm going to talk about. We've got the influence of carbon, which we'll mention now. We've got labour supply, which scores really high, and that is actually a big negative. You'll see big, a big. Is, we call this a heat map. Uh, in terms of it visualizes what are the pressures and what are the challenges on our supply chain. And actually, in terms of that's probably the biggest challenge we had in the UK. And we were mapping that out. We got forage quality, and that's obviously dependent on the season. And then we've obviously got milk price feed price ratio, which we talked about. And in the UK, interestingly enough, the, uh, the, the, the actual correlation between milk price and feed price ratio has dropped from 74% five, ten years ago to 50%. It is no longer the be-all and end-all in terms of milk flow. And hence, I was listening with interest to uh, Philip's paper yesterday. It is, as Philip has done, actually related to far more other things. And it's related to actually the on-farm costs, cost inflation, what's going on elsewhere in the, in the business. And actually, those were the things which will determine milk flow. So it, it, it's still very, very important not to be ignored. It's probably one of the biggest factors. But it is, it is only there. And obviously, at the bottom, milk price can overcome everything. So if things are really horrible, a good milk price will actually make you feel better, even though those miserable farmers in that survey, Dorothy, are very hard to please, uh, you know, in, in this world. But those are the challenges, and that gives you a flavor for all the challenges. We can normally map out, I think, about one year sensibly on milk flow. I think if you get beyond that, we start to, the whole thing starts to fall apart. So we haven't got there yet. So I wait with interest to see how Philip, I think what Philip's got here in terms of bringing it to the overall market is fantastic. 
But in terms of our work in terms of the, in the UK, this is a good platform to share this sort of information because we're here to share and learn from each other. Then in the two cases, and we would cover about 50% of UK milk volume, so about 7 billion litres, then we've actually got the forecasting accuracy around 99%. So you can actually really get your accuracy and you're helping the forecasting teams within those businesses. We are not doing the forecast for them. We're actually helping them to improve their accuracy of forecast. So I'll just give you a bit of a challenge, but the big one going out in the medium term is the environmental reset. And it's all to do, as you know, with the fact that we've actually got a different world. And you heard me say this, uh, some of you on the platform last year, so I'll, sorry, I'll just repeat it for 30 seconds. Now, I was part of the problem. I was brought up at university too long ago, and I was brought up into a world where there was surplus food, and all we had to do was produce food cheaper and cheaper, because that's what people wanted. Uh, and actually, we did it at the price of the environment, uh, without full consideration of the environmental cost. And suddenly somebody comes along and says, hold on, there's an environmental cost to what you're doing. People are working for nothing. The rivers are getting polluted. We've actually polluted the environment. I don't think you're doing things right. Hey, we've got to rebalance the books. So we've now got... To, Eric's point about competitiveness in that session. I think that you could do a brilliant session now in terms of what is competitiveness. It is not about producing milk at the lowest possible price. That is what, that's the old fashioned way, which I was brought up on, they can always do it cheaper in New Zealand. Well, look where it got. It didn't work, did it? Because actually it's ended up costing the environment and now they're being constrained in terms of what they can do. So therefore we are in a different world and actually in terms of what well, we're gonna balance that, we've got to try and feed the world within that context. Now, what we're faced with, and this was in terms of farmers, is that we're faced with a world where actually you've got a price-driven market. And that's what we've got now. I mean, that's short term, that's what it is. And this was uh, from a conference we talked to dairy traders at Ukule in Brussels earlier on this year. But on the other side, the long term, we've got, and I'm just going to pick on the one, because you've talked about animal welfare, but license to operate is key, and we're going to pick up on that with environmental responsibility. But scope three reporting is really, really critical. For those of you who don't know, please, you need to know, and the conference in September in the UK will be all about it. All our retailers have to now have reports from their suppliers about how much carbon are you delivering to our food supply chain. That is scope three reporting. So all farms in the UK now have to do a carbon footprint. That is mandatory and that's coming along. So if that hasn't happened in your country, it will be happening soon, I can promise you. Because that's the way the world is going. And the retailers now are driving us to say, actually, we... Well, we were in a session with a retailer in the UK recently, and they said, if you don't get your carbon footprint down by the 30% you're promising by 2030, then we will take 20% of your product off the, off the shelves. That's the way we'll deliver our scope three. Now, I think that was a bit of a lunatic uh, sustainability manager in the business. The commercial guy kicked him under the table and said, well, of course, we won't quite do that because we want to sell the product. But it gives you a context in terms of what the pressures are coming down the supply chain. Now, that's what's coming down the supply chain uh, in one way. On the other way, we've also got the compliance we did a project uh, in terms of what we call UK Future Proofing Project. Um, and this isn't published yet. We are going to find the right time to do this because this is important to find the timing to actually prepare the ground. So what the logic here is that we've got a database and that's one of the key things here that you're trying to do. We're all trying to work with data. But in the UK, we've got a database that gives access to 850 farms in terms of looking at uh, what their situation was in terms of current environmental compliance and need for investment. And in terms of the average herd size at 236 cows, 8,450 litres, an average of 236 hectares. So when we surveyed these farms, uh, and it was quite a clever survey background in terms of what we did, then actually what we found is that the key things they've got to invest in in the short to medium term is silage pits, because nearly half our silage pits are non-compliant, right, according to the EA. 
They've got to invest in uh, the slurry storage because we've got Clean Air Act with ammonia limitations. They've got to increase in uh, more land because they've got nitrogen limitations. Probably we're working on 250 kilograms per hectare, but in some parts of the UK it's down to 170. So, you know, all these things are coming down the line. When we worked it out in terms of the, based on EA estimates, uh, that's the environmental agency estimates, then it worked out at an average on those 850 farms of 260,000 euros a farm of capital which annualized over 10 years is 48,000 euros per year. So the, 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 the uh, typing slipped over, apologies about that. But that works out at 200 pounds a year extra cost or about 2.5 euro cents per litre extra cost that we've got to do to deliver in terms of compliance. And the problem is that is not going to deliver any more lower cost. Carbon efficiency will generally deliver lower cost and comes with probably a pretty low price tag. But this has actually got a big price tag, 2.5 cents a litre, and that's about 2 billion uh, euros across the UK industry. And we uh, bulked it up. If it was similar across the EU, the EU dairy industry has got an investment requirement of about 15 to 20 billion uh, euros in the next 10 years. These are big numbers. So you're not going to get that money out of, not out of fresh air um, so these are the other things. So prices will have to go up in order to uh, make this investment. And we all know that actually it's easier to not be a dairy farmer than to be a farmer. Because actually you can do lots more time with your land uh, in terms of putting it aside, environmental options, maybe carbon offsetting in future. I know that's the case in New Zealand. Massive. Uh, renting out the land, trees, etc. Now, the point is that the supply chain, and this is where I'll finish, because I think this is hopefully where we're sharing some best practice, where you can take it back to your businesses or your countries and actually start to say, can we improve knowledge and understanding along our supply chain at a national level within our country? Because the IFCN database is fantastic in terms of international. There's nothing that can beat it in terms of supply side information at an international level. But when you're at a national level, you need to actually have a level of understanding. We started with our database on a business database uh, oh, 15 years ago. And we've got a small team of three people in the uh, business who actually capture data. We do more of it now remotely than actually going on farm. So we capture data from about 750 businesses a year. And we get the cost of production done on a different methodology that you probably we'd all recognize in the room if we went into it. And actually, it's given us the information to be able to produce cost of production reports on a quarterly basis. Now, 10 years ago, people used to say, oh, you've got your cost of production. Oh, don't like those. No, no, no. Farmer, mm, yeah, you're giving away my information. No, I'm not giving that. Now, they all want to do it, and the processors want it, and the retailers want it. And do they want it to screw you? Yes, maybe. But they also increasingly want the information to understand their supply chain and understand whether or not they're going to get continuation and security of supply. And so in the report, there's lots of information. And we now get requests two weeks before publication every quarter. When's the report coming? When's the report coming? Because the supply chain is not in the public domain. The supply chain wants the information because they all, everybody in the supply chain now wants to understand what the numbers are coming down the line. And it will give us the basis of able to make forecasts. And I'm going to use one illustration to, before we summarize. One of the things we do in the report, which I think actually is a very, uh, very interesting point, we actually do monthly dynamic costs. So you can see that where we are in terms of, we had the peak of inflation last year. Inflation's coming out with feed costs, but we've still got milk production costs break even at about 40 pence or around the uh, 40, get that right, probably 47, 48 euro cent. Uh, this is for average farms, by the way. This is a data set that we, we pick on average farms. The more important point is the graph on the right. And actually, that's cash flow. What we can do is we can model the cash flow in terms of what actually happens within, those, within that data sample. And when you actually factor in the cash flow, the blue line uh, is actually where we came out of uh, deficit back in 2021, 22, we got into surplus last summer 
uh, when, no, sorry, the milk prices started rising in July. So you can see the deficit was, the overdraft started to be reduced. This is why farmers get miserable, by the way, average farmers anyway. Uh, and then they had a good winter. They built some cash. And then, hey-ho, if we get 35 pence a litre now going forward, they're going to go back into negative cash. So we can say that from about July, they start going cash negative in their bank. And I can almost guarantee that the effect on milk flow in the UK will be at that point, you'll start to see milk flow come down. Because farmers are driven by cash. Uh, cash drives businesses more than profit, more than anything else. And actually, that's a really good information. So what we've told the dairy supply chain in the UK, many of them paying now 35 pence, is your milk flow is, is going to come off quite easily during the summer of this year uh, on many farms. Now, there is one business currently that is trying to break the mold. And I'll, this is, I'll illustrate the point. I think it's the only one at present we can see. And whether or not they make it happen is debatable. Uh, but there's a business in the UK called Muller. Uh, many of you will know. They do uh, a lot of uh, fresh liquid milk and yogurts in the UK. Not much commodity. And what they basically said at the start of this year is that we can see if we go with the market, we're going to actually have less milk this September, October. And they supply at least half of the major retail and food service sectors in terms of fresh liquid milk. Declining market, but still massively important. And in terms of what they did is that they basically went to those uh, retailers and said in January, if you want to actually get security of supply, if you want sustainability, if you want welfare, if you want all the things you've told us that you do want, we're not going to drop the price to our farmers below cost of production. We will not do it. And, for, and the price will go up when the price goes up with the market, but we won't go below cost of production because we're going to underwrite to give you milk all the way through the winter. Right? So that is their guarantee. Now, they did actually get agreement <laughs> And they held the price for June at 40p, which is roughly cost of production, while the rest of the market went down to 36, 37. Unfortunately, Waller went down further, down to about 30, uh, 33. Uh, and, and actually, Muller then came off down to 38. But they're still around about five, five, six cents better than anybody else in the market. They are the first business, I could honestly say, that is demonstrating that it can monetize actually sustainability and standards. And they do it because only 5% of their business currently is in commodities. The rest of it is to actually branded product or to, to supply chains. Now, I want us to debate that in discussion. I'm sorry I've gone on too long, but it's a really important point because I suspect as the power of the market moves back to processors and farmers in order to be able to actually take some power in this marketplace, they need to actually be prepared and have the evidence, like I presented here today, present your supply chain with evidence. They're rational people in the supply chain. Security of supply will matter above everything else. And it's brilliant hearing what Fonterra are trying to do in terms of their valorization with the, with the shrinking milk supply. That's what we've got to do. We've got to make Ensure that the supply chain with information, and that's what this business is about, and sharing good practice and ideas, actually gets money out the market back to the farmers. So that commodities get commodity prices. But if you want to be in a secure supply chain delivering what everybody says they want, you actually get paid for it. and You don't give it away. That's what this is about. So today is about preparing the pitch. That's what we do in the UK we, when we play cricket. We roll it, we mow it, we get everything ready. There is no point in producing that report today about all the costs in the industry now, because the price is on the floor and everybody goes, well, you're just begging for more money. Wait until next year. Wait until actually the price is rising. That is the time when you go to your customers in your supply chain and you go to them and you say, you know what, we have to do all these things. I think now we need to talk business, don't we? How do we assure long-term supply? And that's the basis of it today. So we are committed to produce more nutrition sustainably. We've said that a number of times now. 
It's about say, securing returns for su sustainability. In future, we will not be reporting a break-even milk price. We will start to report a secure milk price. A milk price that delivers food security. And that's the move we'll move to try and get the supply chain to start thinking about. It takes time, and that's the important thing. So sharing information is the key to move into a secure milk price. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you to show us that, you know, with the data and monitoring, we could give evidence in our hands, you know, to monetize sustainability and in reality to show to the supply chain that, you know, there is cost of what shall be applied in the future. I think, to be fair, I think this is a good tactic for the future to secure profits for our farmers. Now we would like to move across the world to Argentina. Yes, here. I would like to invite on the stage Hugo. Hugo is our dairy consultant and our research partner for many years in Argentina, leading a team, helping us also in data collection. Hugo, I will ask you if you could go here. If okay. the camera will capture right. you then, it would be great. So Hugo, tell us you know, how to operate a business, not with seven, not with 15, but with 100% inflation. Plus. Plus, very important, plus. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the invitation to, to all the, the organization. And when I was asked to talk, to talk about this, um, Lukas' challenge was to, to, to explain you uh, how the farmers survive under this challenging macroeconomic environment. And we decided to agree how they survive and make money because they make profit under this, this supposed to be 100% survival uh, mode. So uh, first, we will try to explain you what we, what, we, uh, what we mean when we say inflation and volatility in Argentina. I usually say that there are three words that means different things in Argentina than the rest of the world. The first is crisis. The second is long term, and the third is volatility. And now probably we have a fourth at this inflation. So Argentina has been in several economical crises during the last, uh, the last years. As an average, one big crisis, I would say, or economic. This was a very big one, uh, probably a, a little overlooked. But it was an economical crisis above uh, around each five years during the last decades. Uh, and when we talk about inflation, I decide to, to, um, to show you there some inflation uh, numbers about the emerging margin markets and developing economies. And some key players of the global dairy industry and also some, some neighbors of our country like Chile and Argentina. You have seen how the inflation has grown during the last years. Even in, in stable economies like the US, Germany, and also in, in our neighbors uh, that were more stable than, than, than us. So the reasons of the world inflation, a combination of supply chain, of supply chain challenges, monetary printing, money printing, and the crisis around the world, the war. Uh, these are the numbers from Argentina. We have been with a, real, a considerable high inflation before the inflation starts in the, world, in the world, and the reasons are quite different. This is the only one reason that is equal um, to the rest of the, of the world. The Argentinian government has faced a, a fiscal deficit during many years, especially during the last populism government. So they, they fill the gap printing money. But also this fiscal deficit and the combination of inflation has been making a capital flight from the country to overseas. So we face inflation at the, at the same at the, as the world is, is facing, but the, the roots of, of the causes are quite different. Um, and to understand how, this, how these farmers behave in their business environment, we cannot take inflation 
alone. Because we say that inflation in our country has friends, especially two friends. One friend is the devaluation rate, and the other one is the financial cost, right? So farmers and businessmen are not just facing with the middle lion, but also with his friends in the sides. Why? Because the, the combination of these three issues um, creates a particular combo uh, for taking decisions at the business environment. Uh, the valuation, the government during the last years has been doing a strong currency control, uh, playing or, or holding the, the currency. They make a lockdown on the U.S. on the possibility of, of purchasing foreign money, what we call the U.S. clamp, and that combination of inflation with a holding exchange rate many times create inflation in U.S. dollars terms, right? And the financial cost. We will talk about loans in the next slides, but the Argentinian farmers has the challenge to define which will be the currency in which, will, in which they will take the loan. Is it, what, is, what it makes more sense, to have a loan at 80% in Argentinian pesos or at 40% in US dollars, as an example. So with that combination of inflation, financial uh, rates, and devaluation, Argentinian farmers take the decisions, and also, there are a lot of opportunities because there are many times during the economical life of these businesses where the inflation finally wash out the, the, um, the interests of some credits. Uh, time ago, I made a short interview to many nice faces that are here in the room uh, to ask them, uh, which is a typical level of debt on total assets in the farms of your country. And when we talk about debt, it's, that's including the land, right? So uh, Mark told us about between 25 and 40, Matthew about 50, John between 20 and 40. In the Netherlands, about one-third of the capital and a little bit lower in, in the UK. You can probably think that during the last year this has changed, even Today at lunchtime, our friend from Denmark told me that in Denmark is just 65%. Okay, so because of the lack of credit, Argentinian farmers invest the round profits. And when you calculate the level of debt in an Argentinian typical farm, it's usually not bigger than 2 or 3%. Okay? So when an Argentinian farmer sees these numbers, they usually say that overseas, the cows are just an excuse for asking for money to the bank. <clears throat> when we talk about volatility, most of you know this graph about the milk to feed price ratio. Argentina is the green line. You have USA here, where most of the time is favorable to produce feed with concentrates. You have the blue line below where New Zealand uh, produced a grass-based system because it's, um, it's difficult to afford uh, feeding concentrates there. Uh, and you have Germany in the pink line. Why I show you this picture? Concentrates is about 45% of the operational expenses in a, far, in a dairy farm. The key point here is that an Argentinian dairy farm has to face that, that green line cross the break-even line very, very often. So it's possible that one year is convenient to, to be close to New Zealand, and the following years you have to shift your cows in order to produce much more milk like the US. So that volatility in the milk to inputs ratio makes a lot of definitions on how you behave and how you design your production system and your business. Another issue of volatility, the exchange rate. This is how has been, how has been developed the official exchange rate and also the unofficial exchange rate, because the government is trying to, to, to cover the sun with the, with the hand, and at the end of the day, the market 
push forward. So there, the, there is a decouple of the exchange rate, which is a, the important link of this. This statement below. The Argentinian farmers are get paid for their milk in Argentinian pesos, but 70% of the operational expenses is directly, directly linked to the US dollar. So after the devaluation, 70% of your cost increase the devaluation percentage, and you have to wait until about six to eight months until your price recovers their value in US terms. And this is also uh, a very common situation. You know that many, many countries overseas empower the exports. We have tax exports. Actually, in the dairy sector, the tax export for cheese and milk powder is around 9%. Of course, uh, the tax export in, in grains means cheaper concentrate for farmers. Okay, so there is a combination of pros and cons, and cons on that environment. So, trying to summarize the the environment in, in in Argentina for doing business, this is somehow the formula here, right? You know that this is the hormone that participates in the fight or flight decision. And our farmer has this highly developed and with a lot of antibodies to, to work with that. So, uh, that environment that sounds terrifying, um, it's not so difficult to be solved by our skilled farmers. So, uh, this was also one of the targets we defined with Lucas to describe the particular sets of skills and abilities that you need to have to handle with that situation. And also some key points that our farmers and businessmen usually use for, for handling um, inflation. Um, so, which is the problem, the, to define the problem, is an increase in the price in all the economy during long run, okay? Which are the consequences of that? First, uncertainty. And the following issue is that the prices are no longer a reference, especially for the consumer. When you have 100% inflation every month for a consumer, it's difficult to define if something is cheap or expensive. Okay? So, from a business point of view, with that situation, there is a potential risk of having very high losses in very short time, or very big profits in very short time. So, uh, when I mean resources allocation in financial non and not in operation, at the end of the day is that Argentinian farmers has to set a lot of time on handling that situation, on looking at the numbers, on defining the purchasing time, the selling time. Uh, and unfortunately, this makes that the commercial relationship, relationship stretched and modify the behavior of, of, of the people. So, which are the targets for, for, for facing inflation under business? Uh, you, try, you have to try not to lose because of finances the wealth you create because of your operation. Uh, the other issue is, as soon as you collect a peso, an Argentinian peso, you should know where you allocate that, try not to keep the Argentinian peso. So that means sometimes to have more cows, to anticipate the purchase of some inputs, but you have to be very fast and quickly changing, trying to stay in what we call hard currency. And also, there are a lot of opportunities under, the, un, under this environment. Even during the last years, the, there has been many new entrants to the, dairy in, to, the, the, to dairy farming because of very cheap credits in Argentinian pesos. And there were many huge investments and developing of infrastructure because of that. Because of very, very cheap money. Uh, going to the to-do list under uh, big inflation periods. Financial timing, so fitting inflows and, outflow, and outflows, that's, that's a key, anticipate purchase of inputs and so on. Um, so many people say this, pay as late as possible and collect the money the sooner. 
Also, some people say that during these inflation times, it's better to, drive, to travel by taxi instead of travel by bus. Because in the bus, you pay when you get in. In the taxi, you pay when you get out. <laughs> right? Relative prices. This is key. Not all the inputs and the products grow under inflation at the same speed. So for taking the definition of which will be the currency you will sell or which will be the input you will buy, you have to be very accurate in, in definitions of relative prices. Uh, different farmers, different behaviors, different strategies. Um, some of them define defensive strategies, just trying to, to keep the value and not lose nothing. And there are other ones, as I told you, that prefer to go for an offensive strategy, trying to get as much of the, of the advantages that appears in these situations. And at the end, and probably the most important of that, just adapt. So our common friend Nicola, in a very good work they develop about resilience, uh, talking about resilience today after these two brave ladies, uh, it's like we feel a rookie, and my, my honor for you. Uh, Nicola told about res resilience like to bones with, without breaking, but the main important point I consider for her conclusions was that resilience farms rely on the resilient qualities of the people that handle them. We can talk a lot about cows, fertilizer, sustainability prices, but at the end of the day, the key point is who is the driver. So we will talk about that driving skills uh, under these conditions instead of the um, strategies I just mentioned in that four points. Uh, we, we used this slide time ago. This doesn't work. Ah, oh, yes. We used this slide time ago uh, in order to make an example of how, we, how it looks at every farmer in Argentina. And in the, in the room, it's, it was also a processor. This is a little bit lazy. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and also, there was an input supplier there. And the, the processor and the input supplier, when they saw this picture, they just put us also there. Um, and we also say that, remember, that we, we were champions, but we start losing. OK? So we know, we know that this guy, sorry, uh, the, this American Lebanon guy wrote this book, and it was in the, page, in the front page of the main newspapers during the pandemic. Uh, but remember that this guy also define this theory, the theory of anti-fragile. And he called the anti-fragility is more than resilience. It's the beneficial stress. It's situations where something after a shock gets even better than before. It's not just surviving. So this is one of the key points for the people that is very skilled in, in, in handling under volatile situations. These shocks are not just for surviving, they became better after that. Sorry. Going, going directly to the set of skills of, this, of, of these farmers, I would say um, considering the, their behaviors. Flexibility. All the time to be flexible and considering that for holding in business, you have to be able to change things. You know, this is the pampa grass, very common in German gardens. I know that the pampa grass is very flexible, right? Uh, and this is probably the most important point related to flexibility. This British poet, once he says, hold habits at heart. So the point is, when you have to change something, it's not just to learn something. The difficult part is to de-learn things or whole habits. So this is one of the key skills related to flexibility. Another point related to flexibility, how you design the farm, how you design your business. 
two key points. The level of depth. The level of depth is your water line. In a volatile environment, considering a mud hole, who you want to be, the small guy or the tall one, right? This guy is 3% depth. This guy is 50% depth. Crystal, right? And related to how you design your business, how you define your liquidity index is very, very important under this condition. Cash is king under these conditions. Even try not to be in, US, in Argentinian pesos. You have to make money with money, not with the bank. So this guy, I, I take this picture in the, Cali, in the San Diego Bay. This guy knows very well how liquidity, liquidity works. Uh, related to flexibility and, and the design of our production system, we must have flexible production systems that let us to go uh, on the extreme, to, to travel between the extremes according the environmental, the, so according the business conditions. So, in order to describe it, we are halfway between New Zealand and the US, and we come and go depending on the ratios we show you before. Of course, maximizing homegrown feed is key, and we use our relatively cheap concentrates for increasing the production per cow. So, um, trying to summarize this, we have seen the, 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 envir the environment where these farmers not just survive, but also make money. We described the particular conditions where they move. We described um, some key strategies, the one, two, three, four, the, the be adaptable, be resilient, be anti-fragile, and have a well-designed system and a, and a well-financially and assets designed business. Um, so this guy um, was the former head coach of the Argentinian rugby team. This guy set the basis of our team uh, that make us to be the All Blacks a couple of years later. Uh, and he usually said that let's enjoy the responsibility. Having a pressure is also a privilege. He teaches his team using that. Being pressured sometimes makes you the best version. So trying to share with you some conclusions about farmers surviving and making money under high inflation and volatility. First, um, being in business usually implies to take a risk. This farmer has not grass and cows, has money in cows and in grass and in land. So if you are a businessman, you like it or not, you will be under risk, unless you are in countries where your government decides the other, right? Second point, keeping flexible, resilient, and creative is a must under volatile conditions. So you have to think yourself if you are a lion that lives inside a zoo or you are a lion that lives inside the forest. And third, I have shown you that even an unfavorable scenario that sounds terrifying for some of you, um, there are always a solution to stay in business, to make money, but you need to make many, many versions of you. And Argentinian producers definitively are masters on that. So mostly of you, most of you know this guy. This guy is not Santa Claus on weekend. Um, he once said, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent which survive to the change, but those who are, which are most adaptable. Today at the morning, a Latvian person said, uh, to be stronger to survive. I should change that to be adaptable to survive. What you don't know that this guy takes his conclusions traveling in the Beagle boat during uh, 18 and 31 in the south of Argentina. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugo. Thank you for this fascinating story.
I think you know a lot of farmers and not only farmers can learn out of the example yeah. of Argentina. I think we discussed just in this session about the secure milk price and how to monetize, monetize sustainability, example of UK. We discover how to fight lions in Argentina in terms of the inflation. I think the last but not least presentation before our panel will be Dutch presentation from our colleague Michel de Haan, representing the Wageningen University, talking about, yes, how to do dairy transformation in the specific condition and policy requirements. So, Michel, please, the floor is yours. Please tell us what is the story of Netherlands. Okay, thank you. You hear me? Okay, really good. Um, the story of the Netherlands is completely different than the Argentinian story. Well, it has some similarities with the story of New Zealand, Matthew, but I think we entered the next phase already. I think if this works. Yeah, I called my uh, presentation challenges for the dairy sector in the Netherlands, uh, but you probably could ask me what's going on in the Netherlands. I want to tell you what's going on in the Netherlands. And that's a lot. The content of the presentation, uh, well, I'd like to tell you a little about the Dutch dairy sector. You need to know how our country and dairy sector looks like, then you can understand why uh, things are going on like they're going on. Then some challenges, and then we discover that the environment or nature um, does not always align with agriculture has some different interests. That's what we discover. And then I will end with some, well, results, conclusions, conclusions, what, what, what can other European countries learn from that, and uh, some results of this short analysis, because we only have 15 minutes, am I right? Well, the Dutch dairy sector. Um, when we talk about agriculture in the Netherlands, it's mainly about dairy farming like 65% of all the agricultural land is used for dairy. Mainly specialized dairy farms, so no crops at those farms. Land really expensive. We learned this morning, well, get access to land. Yes, interesting. <laughs> really expensive, like 70,000 euros up to 100,000 euros for grassland. If we're talking for crops, of flower balls, it's going up to 2,000 euros per hectare. We have um, at this moment about 14,700 dairy farms, and it's a traditional family farms, really good. And an average dairy farm in the Netherlands looks like, well, let's say 66 hectares, zero to 20 percent maize land, and um, about 110 cows. The average milk yield is about 9,000 kilograms, so an average dairy farm is producing a little more than 1 million kilograms per year. And we call it really, or kind of intensive, and uh, our intensity, uh, our, well, we say the amount of milk that's produced per hectare, uh, it's about 16,000 kilograms of milk that we produce per hectare. The other thing, um, Netherlands, this is where we are, this small country, and this is where we are over here. We're even smaller than Latvia. In Europe, we are really small, and, and uh, well, according to the rest of the world, we are really small as well. And um, we're flat. Um, Latvia doesn't have mountains. Well, when we were driving across the country uh, on Sunday, well, okay, I cannot call it mountains, but it was really hilly. It was really <laughs> hilly. But I think we have um, something like three hills in the Netherlands, so the rest is flat, really flat, like we show over here. And, and it's green. Most of the times we have enough rain, water, to keep the land green and, and grow grass or other crops. And we have ditches, 
over here we see ditches, water, which is interesting, nice, but somehow also a constraint. I'll come to that later. And we have flower balls, really tulips, nice for the Netherlands, yes. And pasture grazing, cows pasture grazing, and we have crops, other crops in rotation with grasslands. So that's, that's uh, the Netherlands. And somehow I try to compare countries, like you understand where we are and, and uh, how big other countries are, like, uh, well, some, it's just random countries. I like to include Latvia in there because we're here. Um, UK, a lot bigger. Netherlands, we're small, just 40,000, 41,000 square kilometers. The inhabitants and the milk production. Um, France, a lot bigger. Germany, bigger. New Zealand, bigger. You call your country small, Matthew. Big one. India, don't talk about India. <laughs> Latvia, bigger than the Netherlands. Inhabitants, well, we have 17 million inhabitants. And that's a lot more than Latvia, a lot more than New Zealand. Not more than India, no, of course not. No. But, and our milk production is about uh, 14 million tons. 14 million tons. I think it's about the 15th producer in the world. Like, we don't see our country in the world map, so that's a lot. And, and um, well, India produce is, is a lot more. Latvia, I learned this morning, it's a little less, but okay. Let's round it to up to 2 million tons. Then we can divide it, and this is probably the interesting picture, uh, the people per square kilometer, it's the highest in India. Well, I've learned last year India had, uh, was the biggest country as it comes to population. Good. But still, we have a lot of people per square kilometer. But the milk production, per square kilometer, really high in the Netherlands. And that's mainly the story. Well, we are really intensive. Um, we are kind of farming in the backyard of cities. It's a, the Netherlands, maybe it's, it's a big city, and, and, and we are farming over there. And we want to have it all in the Netherlands. We want to have dairy farming. We want to have crops, flower balls. We want to have cities. We want to have tourism. We want to have refugees. We want to have it all. And that's hardly possible. It's difficult. You cannot have it all. You're smiling, Eric. Remke said you cannot have it all. <coughs> and he's right. So that's, that's basically describing the problem. <coughs> Going to the environmental challenges, I wrote down some numbers, uh, but it's, it's telling its story already. Um, first one is really important at this moment, at this very moment. It's about ammonia emission, nitrogen. Um, and we need to go down with our ammonia emission, like more than 40% ammonia emission. <coughs> well, yesterday, Today, the, the day before yesterday, nobody talked about ammonia emission. But it's a big issue in the Netherlands. And I know it's an issue in, in Belgium. And it probably will become an issue in other countries in Europe. Then talking about greenhouse gases should be also a lot less. And that means methane, nitrous oxide, carbon sequestration, um, and water quality. I talked about ditches. And, uh, well, we have to live up to the nitrate directive, the water directive, and that's an EU directive. And we're monitoring our surface water quality, groundwater quality, and it's not sufficient. We really have nice digits, but it's not sufficient. So we must lower our nitrogen and phosphate application now from this year on. Um, there must be three meters along the ditches without application of nitrogen, uh, artificial application, and manure application. 
And the NITE directive says, well, we don't get any derogation anymore from 2026, which means uh, we can only apply 40 tons a manure per hectare. Maybe, well, that seems a lot for a lot of farms all around the world, but it's not a lot for the Netherlands. It means a lot of cost. And the other thing is biodiversity. And the Dutch government says, well, we want to be front runner in circularity. Really, really important. And climate neutral in 2050. And so on. I Probably I forget something. Yes, and then we have politicians. We have politicians. Yeah. And we have also, well, let's start with, with, with uh, the public, people. Um, the people have a voice. We're living in a backyard of cities. So, and we have 17 million people, and, um, well, I would say less than 2% that are involved somehow in agricultural activity. So that means, well, let's say 98% doesn't know what agriculture is about. It's not just dairy farming agriculture. And the people have a voice. People say it's wrong to keep animals for producing food. That's what people say. Yeah, you're laughing. And people say, Farmers pollute. It's not good. And people say, well, farmers don't care about animals. They just care about profit. And we have social media. Twitter, Facebook, television programs. And people listen to those people. So that's becoming a, well, huge issue. And we have politicians who want to have, go have votes. And this politician says, well, let's cut down the number of li livestock by 50%. 50%. That's huge. And he's, he keeps on telling that. So that's um, interesting. And last year, this map was introduced. I'll tell you what it is. We call it a nitrogen map. And, and, and this is about how much the ammonia emission must be lowered. And, and well, I showed you already, it's about 41% that it must be uh, reduced. And, and it's from 17 up to 95% that it has to be declined. And this map was sent out to all farmers and they were furious, they were angry. We, for you, for a record, now we have a Ministry of Nitrogen. And that published this map. Interesting. So, last year, we had some farmer protests. Farmers drove the tractors to the road. Even German farmers came. Yeah. During the nights, and they had a big protest over there, telling, oh, government, you're blaming us for everything that's going wrong. We hate it. But that's what's going on. Again, politics. Meanwhile, I think in 2020, another political party was founded. The farmer movement, a uh, farmer civilian movement, sorry. Baby Bay, farmer civilian movement. And that political party well, kind of represented the voice of people, not just farmers, people that didn't agree with the current government. And that was about nitrogen, but it's about a lot of other mistakes that the government's making in the Netherlands. And it's, it's about gas, energy, it's about uh, taxes, and a lot of people are were unhappy. And in 2021, we had elections for the national government, and, and this lady, the front runner of, the, of this, this political party, just got one seat in the parliament, one of 150 seats. She was happy and uh, drove with a tractor to The Hague. Nice. Nice. Meanwhile, 
it became 2023 and we had elections for the provinces. We have 12 provinces in the Netherlands and we had elections for the provinces. This lady, again, was really happy because in every province she became the biggest party. That's, that's really a big thing. So, the current government was confused. Whoa, what's going on? We are doing something wrong. There must be happening something. Hmm, what should we do? Well, let's come up with an agricultural agreement. Agreement. That means the government, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, wants to make an agreement with um, organizations representing the farmers, and I say it's more than five. Well, the, the um, agriculture is kind of divided in the, in the Netherlands, not just dairy, but it's also crops and pigs and poultry, and within dairy it's uh, extreme dairy farms, um, it's intensive dairy farms, organic dairy farms, so we don't agree. We don't agree. But an agriculture agreement must be made with farmers associations, with retail, with nature associations, and that's about reaching goals. How to reach goals, when to reach goals, and, and that's about environmental goals but also how to gain sufficient income. Because the farmers told the society and, 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 and the government, well, if we need to be more sustainable, as you tell us, if we're not sustainable enough already, if we need to be more sustainable, it's costing money. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. We need to organize money. So an agriculture agreement needs to be made. And it was due on the 18th of May, but still not there. We don't have an agriculture agreement. So, now I should end the presentation because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and that's not really satisfying for you. So, I have some expectations, my personal expectations. So, don't quote me on that. It's, it's not in the agriculture agreement, but I think what's, well, something's going to happen. Um, we need to produce less ammonia. That's going to happen. Less methane, less nitrous oxide, and less CO2, and more, more bi biodiversity. And not just a little, big time. That's, that's going to be in the agriculture agreement, if there will be an agreement at all. And there will be, no, yesterday, um, there was a purchase scheme announced about purchasing, purchasing farms. Farms close to, I forgot a word, sorry, close to nature areas. They will get the opportunity that the national government uh, will purchase the farm. And it's about 3,000 farms, which is a lot. I don't know what's going to happen. It's just introduced yesterday. And there's a stimulus to keep less animals. And, and there's a tendency to be more extensive and organic. That's supposed, supposed to be better. And I expect some measures that the government says, well, you need to take some measures, dear farmers, probably about manure, about barns, about storage of manure, uh, maybe uh, the length, maybe you can, you have to store the manure for like nine, ten months. Um, I don't know. Um, something about sensor technology, um, like over here, about measuring ammonia in barns, how much it is, and maybe even measuring methane emissions. And I expect a system, a certified calculation system, some kind of mineral accounting system, that's what the government is promising, uh, where farmers well, can prove what the performance is. And, and 
how much the contribution is to, well, let's say ammonia emission or greenhouse gas emissions, or they can get rewarded or punished if the performance is not too well. And, um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about um, uh, measures. It could also be measures to, uh, to have lower emissions, ammonia emissions, or this is, this is methane inhibitors. Uh, you mentioned it already. Uh, it's, that's happening already on farms in the Netherlands using methane inhibit inhibitors. And what's also in there, what I expect, uh, the urge to society and retail for higher agricultural prices. It's an urge, it's not a promise, but I don't know what's, what's in there. And I expect, it's my personal expectation, uh, probably the national government will uh, reserve extra money for grassland in, with restrictions in use. Like uh, you can uh, go there uh, after the 15th of June or no application of nitrogen. Something like that. That's something that I expect. Some conclusions. Um, what can we learn from that? Um, well, in the Netherlands, and I think in Europe, and maybe in other countries as well, uh, there's increasing attention for climate and ammonia. Ammonia is in Europe also really important. And society has an opinion, a voice, and an influence. We all know social media, television, and, and um, if it's truth or wrong, it doesn't matter. They're just telling. And we know society is not fond of industrial dairy farming. Um, maybe you've all heard of, at least in the Netherlands, uh, mega barns. If you, if you say mega farms or mega barns, that's not positive, is it? So that's what they are telling us. And, and then I ask people, well, what's a mega farm? Um, ah, well, two and a cows, two and a cows, that's mega. And that's wrong. Yeah, you, you laugh about it, but that's what's happening. And, and the other thing is that EU legislation has large impact on the Dutch agriculture. Really, and probably for other countries, EU countries as well. Um, the question was, well, Lucas asked me a question, well, do you have a legislation about animal numbers? No, so far we do not, so far. But maybe there will be a debate about animal numbers, because the, the public says, well, we don't trust the farmers, they cannot take the right measures. Um, the best solution is just reduce animal numbers. So we know you're moving to the, to the good way. Um, I'm wondering if and what uh, the agriculture agreement would be, maybe we will expect more farmer protests. And I will end, <laughs> I will try to end a little optimistic. Um, I'm sure, I know, that avoiding losses and being efficient eventually always will pay off. And I'm also sure there will be room for all kinds of dairy farmers, even in the Netherlands. So I'll, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Michel, you can stay on the stage okay. and take a seat. Um, yes, thank you very much. I think we see that the components of energy, and that's what we talk at the beginning of today, is everywhere. Yeah, we are talking about feet, we are talking about the costs, we are talking about the environmental regulations. And I think we just had a three rounds fight because yeah, we were fighting retailers in UK, we were fighting the inflation alliance in, in Argentina, and then at the end, yeah, the last round what was with the politics in Netherlands. But I think I would like to invite Thorsten and Dorothy to run the panel and maybe scratch a bit deeper. And of course, if you have any questions, please, please feel free. Please, Thorsten and Dorothy. Thank you. Please, John. Please, Hugo. Um, thank you for this wonderful case studies. 
Um, may I just have your hands uh, in the audience who is still awake and who has energy? Okay, do you want some more energy? If you like, stand up, please. Stand up, stretch yourself. Right? If you want to hop, right? It puts blood in your brain. You can better think, right? That's very good. Right? Stretch yourself. You can kick your neighbor if you like, right? <laughs> okay, now we have energy. The purpose of this session is very... Oh, we are streaming, right? Sorry, I forgot the, uh, if the people are online, uh, you, if you do some sports, do yourself. So, I need to stand here? Here. Thank you, Amelie. So, the, pur the purpose of this session is very easy. Argentina is not Holland. Holland is not UK. But uh, you might have here problems in these countries which you have in your country tomorrow. You might see here solutions which you might use in your country. Or you have ways to solve problems which you could use at home. So thanks a lot for this fantastic sessions. And Dorothy, the same first question is with you. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think what we saw, very different problems and very different sort of people, stakeholders in the dairy chain to solve the problems or to work with in order to get the problems under control. So for example, just maybe a little bit of detailed questions. John, I found it very interesting and maybe this would be also something for the Netherlands, that you put actually costs on sustainability and said we have to increase the price in order, well, we have to internalize the externalization of the costs again. So probably for Argentina, it's not yet on the agenda, but I think also, I mean, us within Europe, um, this is a topic. But you were talking about the processors putting pressure. Do you think that this is, and you are a country below self-sufficiency, so there is a lot more power of the processors than it would be in a country where we have to export, you know, and work with, the, with our neighbors around where we export to. So what do you think would your solution, like the Muller example, which I found very nice, would that also work in a country which is above self-sufficiency? <laughs> very good question. Right, okay. That, dissect it. You're exactly right. Muller is in a very strong position because in the UK, although it's a declining market, and it's around about, it's just less than half of the market is in fresh liquid milk, then actually there's really, it's only mainly supplied to retail and food service by Muller and Arla. So although Arla can't set the price in the UK in a similar way to Muller, actually they set their price across the European uh, global price. But the point is that Muller are in a better position because they are in that position to negotiate. And if I talked now about cheesemakers in the UK, they would say exactly what you've just said. They would say, well, it's okay for Muller. We can't do that. In fact, we've got major problems in the cheese sector because we've had lots of inflation and we've had lots of cost increases that we've not recovered from the market. So it will, I, I totally endorse what you say. But I think you'd start the process by, you know, it's, it's, yeah, good, good friend, you know, about Chris Walker, and he said, you know, if you want to make something happen, you know, it's a bit like your neighbour, you know, if you, if, if you want to make a change, you plant a tree in your hedge, if it's a big tree, your neighbour will be going, oi, move that big tree, you've upset me. Right, but if it's a small sapling and actually he doesn't notice, but we make the point, it's there, then gradually as it grows, people get used to it. And you've got to make points, you've got to start somewhere in order to make the change. And when you actually look at a global context, and I talk this through with Eric a lot, then we are moving into a world of shortfalls. But there will be more dairy shortfalls. And, and in that world, people who want to trade commodities will inevitably start to say, well, actually, you know, the price of milk goes up. Security matters. Well, if you want the security, we're giving you the example. That then becomes the example as to how you can start to build secure supply chains. It's just that's what's going to happen. 
I suspect, in a world of shortfalls. And commodities, commodity dairy products, well, if you do, if you'd work this over 10 years, and I'd welcome views from the audience, especially Erica's view, then I suspect dairy commodities as a percentage of trade, they, they've got problems. Where will you get that? Where will you get the dairy commodities material, right? Thank you, okay, John. Thanks, John. Um, you I, I have one question for uh, Michelle and one question for Hugo. And it's a serious one. In Holland, you have protesting millionaires. Fam dairy farmers in Holland are millionaires. Protesting, sitting on two to three million euro on equity. What is the reason to stay in Holland as dairy farmer? And the same thing, Hugo, with your managerial capabilities and very challenging environment, why not using these skills in another country where this adrenaline could be maybe much better turned in value than in the country we are currently in? Well, really good question. Um, few questions. Well, it's a uh, farmers are rich. They have a lot of equity, but it's a question of live poor, die rich. So you're only rich if you sell. And if you want your son to take over, it's it's for a, a lesser value. It's not for a market value, but that's, that's um, that point. Why stay in the Netherlands? Um, well, some, no, I, I would say a lot of dairy farmers in the past um, said, well, I'll grow abroad. Um, a lot of immigration to other countries. Uh, Dutch people like to be dairy farmer, and they have the skills to be dairy farmer. And, and, and well, it's somehow now also, they actually can't believe that this is happening. But... Um, to be honest, farmers really get fed up with the regulations and, and well, it's kind of new. Just yesterday that purchase scheme was launched. I'm, I'm wondering how many farmers will, um, will well, apply for that. But it's, um, some will go, some will stay, um, some like to stay. And, 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 well, that's not an aspect with Dutch farmers maybe with Dutch people or just people, uh, they like to complain. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I take it. <laughs> Thank you. That's Thanks. Not cool. <laughs> yes. Uh, farming under pressure in Argentina, why to stay and not to export your capabilities in some way? Um, I'm in the opinion that sometimes people uh, get familiar with an environment and they consider something normal that it's not normal, it's just common, right? So um, first is that, I mean, because <clears throat> at the end of the day, even with that high demand of management skills, you got comfortable in that situation. Second, is that um, you know that we have a Latin roots. So some people say that Argentinians are, I told some of you, and Argentinians are uh, Italians that speak Spanish. Um, and that's another issue. Um, there are a lot of social problems, but the quality of life, especially in the countryside, related to the culture values, uh, is very high compared with other countries. It's very, very high. Uh, so that's another reason. And the other answer, the other part of the answer is there are some people that are exploring that even we have a case that is exploring to lease dairy farms in Spain. It's in conversation with farmers that want to quit the activity in Spain. Very good. So thank you. Is there any question in the audience or online? 
Rinze. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the questions. Uh, I have a question to all three of the panelists because you all started with a political component in there. And my question is, uh, do you believe that the farming community or agriculture community can influence politics or is it something you have to deal with? I, I don't think, uh, I'll be interested to hear what the others say and I, I, it'd be great if others in the room want to chip in because we've all got valid room views and there's some very intelligent people in the room here. I, I, I would make a point and we've talked about this and looked at it in, um, in, in, in the Netherlands. I don't think it might have started as a farmer. It isn't about farmers, it's about more. Farmers and what they're seeing in the Netherlands, and Michelle, you can comment. I think it's a representation of a divided society. And I think it comes out of social media. I think it comes out of the same issues that you've got in the US in terms of intolerance on the left and the right for each other. And you get people taking positions. And I think what's happened, and I might be wrong, but I think it's a fight back, it's a kickback by people in, in, in the Netherlands who feel that they're not, their voice is not being heard. That might be the rural community, but it starts with the rural community, but others have joined them because they think, yes, we agree too. We think we're being told far too much what to do, how to live, how we should behave, and, and we don't like it. And it tends to come from the left. And that's when you've got the left and the left start to keep on telling society and people what to do, in the end, you get a kickback, and it's fueled by social media. I might be wrong. I don't think it's purely about farmers. I might be, what, do, what do you think, Michel? Well, coming back to the question, me, myself, I'm rather naive, so I think, well, uh, you cannot influence politics. But on the other hand, looking at Ugo, I think so. There's a lot of things you can influence politics. And I showed you, we had a new political party, BBB, and, and, and it's not just farmers that are sympathizing with that political party. And somehow it's, it's getting influence. And it's all, 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 well, many other civilians are quite fed up with, with, with the mistakes our government is making and, and uh, <sighs> telling about nitrogen and nature. Come on. Um, so, in the end, I think, yeah, there is an influence, yeah. Um, Michel, may I have a question for you? I think the, the Dutch example with this uh, party is really stimulating, right? That you can start a new political party, becoming a main power, and start a political power. And then you mentioned also this political agreement, right? What do you think, if they would reach now an agreement, would that last until 2024, 26, 28, 2030? When will that be again on the plate? Yeah, that's a nice one. Um, I don't know, and that's the honest answer. Um, um, a, an agreement needs to be signed by many parties, or at least two. And, and now the government is making all kinds of proposals and, and I, I showed you there, were, there are a lot of agriculture um, organizations um, in talking with the government and the minister. But the Dutch agriculture sector is also divided. So the kind of mild uh, agriculture sector is still talking with the ministry. And the extreme is not talking anymore. No, I'm away. I'm not talking anymore. So that's... Um, if some party, if some organization is signing the agreement, others will say, well, I didn't sign it. It's not my agreement. I hate it. So I don't know how long it will last if somehow someone is signing. And the other thing uh, is... Uh, uh, Michel, may I interrupt you? Because a lot of the points are coming step by step, right? Yeah. There was a nitrous story, right? And then you have a phosphate story, and then you have a ditch story, and then, you know, a lot of the points which you have on the agenda are, for me, maybe just three to five years old. So the question is, how much is 
again to come in the next three to years where an agreement which you might reach now will be redone because on new things, things coming up. Yeah, that's what I would try to mention. Now uh, we have a government that is supposed to last to 2025. But the, the government is kind of afraid, uh, do we make that time? So um, if not, um, we don't know what's going to happen. So, so it means that, but I think Lucas mentioned that uh, in his presentation, he said, look, we don't have a society agreement, right? You are one step further because you work on an agreement, yeah. but even if you work on it, uh, be aware that you define a time frame uh, until at least it lasts, right? Then yeah. at least you have maybe three years, five years, yeah. eight years peace, right? Yeah. Uh, on that one. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that's what farmers would like as well. Even if it's a bad message, uh, we want to have some clarity. Yeah. Good. Uh, Hugo, who makes good policy in Argentina? Uh, tough question. Uh, yeah. Translated the one to Yes, no, but the, 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 related to Rinse. Um, I mean, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, I mean, Argentina is an agriculture economy. So farming is a powerhouse of wealth creation. And politics knows that. I don't see in a, in a, in a country where the urban population is so big compared to the farming population, I don't see a agriculture party in the, in the short term. Uh, also, as same as the Netherlands, the um, farming organizations are pretty much divided. That doesn't help. Um, but there are two other things. First, uh, we talk about farmers or urban people. And in each farmer, you have a citizen. And we usually forget that. Uh, that is worried about environmental and all, all things that all, also the urban people are. But the most important thing related to how can farmers inf or, or if farmers will influence policy, uh, there is a lot of signals everywhere, in New Zealand, in the Netherlands, in Argentina, that farmer has probably not a party, but the politics knows where are the, limited, the limits until you can disturb the farmers. They know that very good, right? So let's say that it will be difficult in our conditions to have a formal representation, but there is a lot of influence uh, considering that farmers set a frame, a set of exports and value creation, and also where are the limits, the limits when I stop to be a farmer and I start to be a citizen, right? Is there, you know, just to, to come back to the whole thing, the whole debate on what you can put on farmers and demand and, uh, you know, how much you sacrifice your own food security, etc., etc., has been before the Ukraine uh, war and after. And I think there's a new dimension coming in into that. This, of the whole issue of food security, is this discussed in your country? It doesn't matter. A uh, populist government highlight that we need to keep food security even in a country that can feed 100 million people, right? But I would highlight what Olga and Hannah said, and that was really recognized by the society during the pandemic. Today, they say at the morning that the farming were the backbone of, of, the, front, of the battlefront. And people remember that, and remember that from the COVID times. They have it very, very present. Is it the same with you? Um, there is some discussion about food and food security. It, it's like farmers' organizations say, well, be aware, we are feeding you, we are feeding the world. We are, <laughs> there's a war going on now. Be, uh, know that... We, we make sure that you get food. And then um, the people in the Netherlands say, well, we are producing a lot of milk. Uh, at least half of the milk uh, we are exporting. So there's still enough. It can be a little less, so no problem. 
That's what the community says. So food is always there. Well, yeah, well, that's what the, 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 the public says. It, we still have enough. Uh, they probably forget that we are importing a lot. Otherwise, we wouldn't be drinking coffee or something. Just while the question comes along, there's just one observation I want to make in terms of, you know, with all due respect, we are in the, the northwestern Europe and, we, and actually we're relatively wealthy. We're unlikely in a food security crisis to be the first people to suffer. You know, it, it's other people in other places will suffer before us because of our actions. And we've got to, we've got to convince politicians of that. And that's a, quite a big discussion to have. And I'd just like to say one thing about the Netherlands. I remember a friend of mine went there 35 years ago. And I'm sorry, 35 years ago, all this was written in the stars. We all knew this was going to happen. They talked about it when they came back. It's not sustainable. How often do we see things, and we're party to it, that we know are not sustainable, and we close our eyes to these things, and they come along and bite us. Good point. Matthew, authority, you have a question? Well, yes, it was a little bit uh, getting onto our continuing, what you were saying, a provocative question. I mean, we are just talking right now, the government is a bad guy, you know, putting restrictions on the farmers. But what do the farmers say, say themselves? Because they see that the rivers are polluted or whatever. So, uh, you know, what does the farmer say? what should be done so that they also have a future in 10, 15, 20 years time. So this would be maybe a little bit provocative, but it has to come from the farmers themselves. It's a great, it's a great point, Dorothy. And, and, and the thing is that I think one of the things we try to do in the UK in the dairy sector, the meat sector is, is appalling. If they get eliminated by politicians, it will be, frankly, their own fault because they haven't engaged. You've got to have a strategy to actually engage with society, to demonstrate that you are doing good and that you take what they are concerned about seriously and that you are listening. Because then the reasonable people in society say, hold off, stop gluing your hands to windows and stop stopping the traffic. We give these people a break because they've, they've demonstrated that they're trying to do good. And we've got to do, we've got to be responsible for our own industry and what we do for ourselves. Very good. Matthew. Just coming back to um, competitiveness. It's been a, a word that's been thrown around a bit over the last few days, and it's an important word. And I agree with you, John, that cost of uh, milk production is an important component of competitiveness. But really what it comes down to is efficiency. And... Um, of course, in today's world, the environment is important too. So those that can produce uh, milk and, and dairy products most efficiently, including minimizing the impacts on the environment, will be the winners. Um, and I was talking about brand reputation because, you know, at the end of the day, we're only as good as the brand we stand behind. And if we've got that brand that's competitive, including environmentally sustainable, Aren't we on to a winner? Isn't that what the world wants? Yes, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, totally, and I think competitiveness will be about, as I was trying to reference, and we, 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 we've got in the UK, we've, based on Nicholas Shadbolt's work, by the way, isn't it brilliant that we're such a small community? Uh, we developed an R500 score, so we, we score businesses on a resilience factor out of 500. And, and, and I think what that demonstrates, if you take that concept, is that there's more to producing food than just doing it at the lowest possible price. So it's a component mix. And I don't think it's about carbon. Uh, that was said this morning. Uh, it is to be just focused on carbon about sustainability is the wrong, that's, a, that's the wrong dimension. One of the things we do have as a dilemma, and this is a, a, a legitimate discussion to have, in a forum like this, the unit we saw yesterday, and when we host uh, in September in Chester, we will take you to a large unit like the one yesterday, and it can produce um, dairy, and it, I, I would argue with the metric, but it produces dairy with a 0 .4, 0 0.74 kilogram 
per litre carbon figure because he's got total control. 0, uh, 0.4 yeah. kg. No, zero, sorry, 0.74, sorry. 0.74. Where an average European farm is 1.4 yeah. and the world average has 2.4. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's quite feasible because that unit has got all the technology and everything there, it is quite feasible, it could even reach whatever you want to call it, neutral, zero, whatever. I, I don't want to get into that because I'm not the expert. That is, it, that is because he's got so many controls and we saw that yesterday on Sunday. The, the large unit in the afternoon has got a circular farming system. It, it, it is very, very sustainable, but it doesn't appeal to consumers because the cows are housed and yet it probably delivers a very sustainable product. And, and, and when you see the other farm, which we'll see in September, it's an organic spring carving grazing farm and it can't get below one. It will never, because it's got very limited means to manipulate its, its figures in terms of the carbon footprint. So I think there is an element to have a discussion here about how if you're going to measure sustainability, all these metrics, they do mix in, and there's, it's finding different, different fits for different things. That's what I'll just start. Very good. Let me close here, because I, I think we had an excellent session, and I'd like to wrap it up. There are already tons of problems in your current dairy regions, correct? And be aware, there are new problems to come in the next three to five years. At the same time, there will be new solutions to come up, right? And be aware, each of you, your farm, your organization, your role, you will be moved outside to the, or to the corner of the comfort zone in the next three to five years. And if that's the case, be aware, you have people here to talk to and maybe people who have been already ahead out, or in this part of the comfort zone, which you can benefit from. So make use of that, ask them, and I think thanks for Hugo, thanks for uh, Michelle, thanks for, for John. Excellent examples, and thanks a lot for your great contribu contribution. Thank you. Good, Thurston. I think we are 4.30. Uh, we finished. I think it's time to somehow sum up the conference. Yes. Yes. So maybe before, you know, we will wrap it up, maybe we can give a short task to all the participants here. Yep. And if you could discuss around your table you know, and talk what is the key take-home message for you after this event, before we close, we'll be very happy to hear it. So maybe let's spend five minutes around your table, discuss it. Later on, we would like to look, you know, for key message out of the, each of the table to collect it fast, as we would like to write us a paper about that. Yes, and we are the journalists looking for headline messages. Please, people... People, 80 percent of the people just read the headline. So, I, what is a great headline you come out of out of your learning of the last two days? Thank you. Thank you.
So, Lukas. Good. Please prepare your key statement. Amelie will walk around the tables and collect it. You want to start Guys, OK, I think we can, we can start with the first table here. Well, actually, it was really difficult for us to define some short uh, uh, headline. Please, uh, please can, and, can. But the home... home so, Okay. Uh, but it's great that the negotiations and discussions are ongoing. That means that there are a lot of uh, things to take home and to share with our farmers and associations. But actually, our table was talking a lot about uh, finding out a short message or headline uh, after this conference, but it was quite difficult. So what we have mentioned to each other and highlighted that we were impressed that instead of 24 million tons plus last year under all the conditions of profitability and good, can, uh, and good opportunities, uh, dairy world produced only plus 4 million tons. And that must indicate us that we are on the edge, we are at the door of huge changes yes. in the dairy sector. But uh, also it indicates us uh, their uh, possibilities and chances that it gives to our farmers. And the more flexible we will be, the more open we will be, uh, the more chances to develop we will have. And actually, energy crisis was the last drop to reveal that. Thank you very much. So I think we can refer to the new normal of dairy industry which we were talking in the first day. Thank you very much. Please, the next key headline message. Please keep it short. Yes, uh, well, we had a very good discussion on this table. Uh, we believe that there's a future for farming, of course, but the farmers will see challenges they've never seen before. And with that, I would like to conclude with one of the presentations. Pressure is a privilege. So pressure is the privilege. Thank you very much, Inza. Future for farmers, new challenges, pressure, and privilege. Wow, that's good. Yeah, and I think our conclusion here is that we are overwhelmed by the information and the number of difficulties we are facing in a situation where we also see a lot of opportunities. So our problem is to put the right priorities on what we can do. And the problem is you go home and you know you can only dig where you stand. And what can I do when I come home? And that is the thing where we couldn't agree on the answer because we stand on different places. Thank you. But prioritization and dealing with things one by one. Very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks. In our round table, uh, our conclusion is for sustainability, act local, think global. For smart farming. That's, that's one line. We have two lines. Yeah, and we have two lines uh, because uh, we are three. <laughs> more, more changes, more, more changes uh, coming. Uh, are you ready? More changes, are you ready? More changes coming. More changes coming, are you ready? Very good. <laughs> Don't fight for it. Yeah. 
Please, Odin. Uh, thank you. Um, our table has also discussed uh, various issues. Uh, we are very diverse, but uh, at the end, we are very much connected each other. And uh, without having any transaction costs, uh, we can uh, share similar things among us and really can solve each of our problems by connecting each other. So the networking is the key role here to, make, uh, in, to use the information to solve from the global problems to the local solutions. So networking is a, a key for solving the problems uh, in the yeah, future. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, and Hannah mentioned once that trust-based societies will win because they act on low transaction costs. So what we have here is a trust-based society where everyone can talk with everyone and could learn. Um, thank you very much, Hernan. I think we talked over coffee on that one. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, the, the, um, the key thing that I, that I have learned this conference and, and is reflected in the, the table that we sit is, is I, perhaps not a new lesson, but a lesson learned again, is that the world, the dairy world is a very diverse place. And there is not one or two or three examples of best practice around the world. There are 10 or 15. And some of them, I was particularly struck by Udin's example of best practice in Bangladesh. And that is a really good example of um, efficient dairy operation uh, as a community. And, I, and it, it makes me think that in 2050, um, we will still have 10 or 15 region farm systems and practices and so forth uh, that we will be talking about and arguing about as which is best or whatever. But, but I, I don't think that we will see a, col a collapse of the entire industry to, uh, to a narrow uh, system. Thank you. Who wants to go here? So we can make it very, very shortly. I think the key word is adaptability, adaptability for, the, for, the, for the farmer. So like the Charles Darwin has said from Frugal. Sorry, I didn't get it. Adaptability, adaptability. for the farmer. Adaptability. Adaptability, adaptability. for the farmer, OK. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Yeah. Who's going to speak here? Um, it's already been said, really. Um, we talked about adaptability, being open to change, um, changing methods as needed, um, and also while being mindful that different regions need different solutions, and maybe in some developing regions, different kinds of support as well. Thank you. Any more comments? So, someone has? Nope. Good. I think, Torsten, thank you. And thank all of you for, for your summaries. I think we discussed with Torsten a bit that, you know, what are our key findings out of the conference? Why don't you start? Yes, maybe I would like to just go with our topic of the conference and talk about the challenges and opportunities, you know, to give like top three from, from my side. First of all, starting on the challenges, energy transformation will be bumpy and the fossil fuels will stay with us. And I think it's important in terms of also renewable energies and the transition. For sure, in challenges, environmental regulations and how to comply with that, you know, among the farmers and industry and food security and high consolidation in dairy business. I think we need to deal with that maybe with new technologies or new solutions. In terms of opportunities, for sure, adaptation and change management, how we are working, how we are producing. We need to be more self-sufficient on our farms with feed and energy. Uh, uh, those are the drivers. And at the end, focus on integration inside the supply chain, knowledge exchange, and cooperate together. Yes. So those will be my finding, Thurston. What about you? Well, I especially like this energy thing, because when I looked at the story, story, I completely underestimated its complexity, and it was really eye-opening. So that one was my biggest content learning. 
that my personal learning is, is very simple. I would like to take Eric's view from the moon to Earth. If you look on the Earth today and having the 2050 project, and you think you would not have an ICN, I should be, think we should build it immediately. Now we have it and can use it, so please make use of it. Uh, and by connecting the talents, um, I think we can progress much faster, adapt much faster. That's my point number one. Number one. And number two, by doing that, there's a tremendous reward for you in it. And the reward is very personal. Who has grandchildren? Okay. Either by 2030, 2040, 2050, whatever it takes, your children, your grandchildren will ask you, what have you done for the 10 billion people project? <clears throat> and then you can raise a flag or an orange sunglass and saying, I was part of IFCN, I connected globally, we worked on food, we worked on a food item serving billions of consumers and millions of farming communities. And with that little step, I made a difference for myself and the planet. That's my key takeaway, and that's your biggest reward, which we are working on. And I'm really grateful for all of you joining uh, on this session. There's a lot to do, and I look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think all of us deserve a big applause. Yeah? Yes. Okay. I would like to invite Amelie to the stage. Thank you, Torsten, very much. Okay, yeah, when I'm back on stage, it's mostly because it's all items, right? Yes, please. <laughs> I saw most of you already started, so end of conference always means it's time for the feedback. So you have, sorry, you're on all of your tables, you have the feedback service. If you did not do until now, we would be very happy if you could fill it out. And my lovely colleague, Sophia, will stand at the door if you're going out so and we'll collect it. So we would be very happy that we can improve a little bit for next year. So, Ukash, what else? Yes, I would like to just tackle a few technical steps. So, you know, this conference has also one of the very, so one of the key important reasons of this conference is to validate the results. So you see here the clock. And it's important that you know, our data collection process will finish soon. Uh, so please, if you found any kind of you know, questions or remarks towards the data which you saw last days, please come back to our team until 19 of June, because this will be the date where we'll be starting to closing databases to prepare our daily report. So it's very important. If you see anything, please report back to us. Yeah, and as most likely all of us will be traveling home tomorrow, uh, we wish you safe travels back home. And we will send out a press release and for all live participants, the whole slide deck of the conference until end of this week. And of course, please attend the webinars to stay updated. Yes, and Amelie, what's coming next? Yeah, end of dairy conference means uh, start of the next conference preparation, right? Yes, so exactly. we will be having the IFCN Supporter Conference in Chester this year, end of September, together with Kite Consulting. I think all of you uh, were able to get to know yes. John and, and we'll be talking about... Yeah, so we will be continuing our topic. I think it's very much connected, like John was mentioning before. We were, were talking about the transformation in dairy. Can we do it together? We are bringing the stakeholders from dairy supply chain, you know, and I'll be asking them the questions, how do they prepare themselves for the transformation? Because a lot of those topics which we tackled today were very much about farmers. We would like to also discuss that with the business partners and look towards the future. So we would like to invite all of you also to participate online because we will be streaming part of the conference. So we're closing with that. We would like to talk a bit 
about the future. We always talk, okay, what, are the, what is the next step for the IFC and what is the next dairy conference? And we were talking with some of you already. There were coming ideas from different parts of the world. But I'm very happy to say that since last seven months, we work with our Japanese J-Milk organization about coming back to the idea which we had before pandemic to organize the conference in Japan. We are currently, after seven months, we are very close to agree on all the details. We already work out the agenda. We, would like to, we already work out the plan. And we would like to talk in Japan about Asian dairies standing on locally thinking of globally, especially that people from the West, as we organize majority of our conferences in Europe, we would like to have the opportunity to meet the East. And we would like to you know, bring those communities together. And for IFC, and this will be another big step forward after 20 years to move out of the region of Europe and try to bring more researchers from Asia and from Pacific. So, we would like to invite yes. one guest on the, the stage. The last guest for this dairy conference. So, it's a pleasure for me. I want to invite Hero, the young Hero, on stage. Please join us here. Hero is working with J Milk. Heroes working with the J-Milk is replacing our old hero friend. I think all of you received the communication about that. I'm very happy that, you know, we have the next generations switch, also in Japan. And I would like to ask Hero two questions. First of all, Hero, why do you want to organize IFC and, and conference in Japan? Thank you, Ameri san Thank you, Lucas san Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hiro Shibata, agricultural scientist, PhD. First time, IFCN Dairy Conference. Uh, Lucas-san, say your question again, please. Yes. So why we'd like to organize the conference in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes. <laughs> so this, is exactly over. this is the question. Thank you. No um, I tell you my answers. Mm -hmm. Contribution and curiosity I have four points. One, since J Milk became IFCN researcher and partner in 2014, we have been thinking how we will be able to contribute to IFCN. It seems to us that the time gets matured. Two, friendly researchers from several countries provided precious information to our former researcher, Dr. Hiro Takeshita. His successor, Dr. Hiro Shibata, myself, <laughs> would like to you show how Japanese dairy is going on. Three, as local dairy firm, farmers are facing on critical condition, they are interested in having you and IFCN at Japanese dairy area to exchange comments. Four, 
aiming to aiming at dairy conference 2024 must be held in center of dairy land Hokkaido next year all folks get together again this location not downtown Tokyo <laughs> thank you thank you very much <laughs> well. and I think one more question yes because it's also very important why must you come to Japan as IFC and dairy research partner Thank you, Lucas. -san. That is good question again. <laughs> I tell you my answers. Mm -hmm. Location and combination. I have four points. One, first time of dairy conference in Asian countries. Oh. J Milk is focusing on Asian dairy worlds, including Japan. Two, easy access for Asians and Pan Pacific countries. One and a half hours flight from Tokyo International Airport. You can reach to Hokkaido. Three, easy access for possible events after your arrival. We've got everything you need within one hour drive radiate. Mm -hmm. Planning to invite local dairy farmer and managers of dairy processing companies at venue. I can take you to two different sides of farm, farms and processing factory. Finally, on top of dairy conference, I provide nice hospitality fine Japanese cuisines, cultures. Possibly including fresh seafood, Hokkaido barbecue, hot springs, karaoke, sake, etc., etc. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you very much, Hiro. Thank you for everything and thank you for preparation as we were discussing with June and with Hero those points last days. So after this introduction, I think all of you need to come, especially with the last point of sake and cuisine. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that's why we ask you in the survey if you would like to come. Of course, it's always connected with the organization. We know that, that you need to apply. It's a not short trip. It takes time. But I think after 20 years, it's a good opportunity to also start and develop new steps for IFCN, like organizing the first time conference in Asia. To respect all our partners worldwide, and now also appreciate those people who often were flying here 20 hours, where you were able to commute in Europe in one hour, 
Now we will change it. So now, please, all the people from Europe show the commitment to the network and to the future. To close the topic, we will work with June and with J Milk and with Hero in the next two months on the details, and we will announce the final decision and information until end of July. So thank you very much. Let's stay with the thank yous. So I want to say a little more thank yous. First of all, to the research partner who are here live and online today. Of course, to all of our sponsors, because without you, it would not be possible to be here today. Um, of course, all our speakers and panelists, you made the program, the agenda, what it was. And in the end, I want to have my IFC and team with me on stage because I think they deserve a really big applause. So please, all of you, come up on stage. <laughs> Anders, you too. Eric, where's Eric? Eric is gone. You did a really great job, and I'm really proud. That's my team. Yes, thank you very much. And I think, Sheen, you would like to say something as an Air One manager to our researchers, please. Yes, so first, I want to <clears throat> I wanna pay a special thank you to our Ukrainian researchers over there. Olga and uh, Hannah, thank you so much for joining our uh, dairy conference. We're really happy to have you here. So everybody, can you applaud for them? Yeah, and also, I want to say thank you to everyone here, as Emily said already. Yes. <laughs> and from my side, I would like to say big thanks to Renars and Sylvia. To, who helped us to organize this conference. We came here in January. Weather was much worse. So if I could ask you to come on the stage. Yeah, we will have more speeches in the evenings. But I think you deserve really big applause from, from everybody here. So once again. Maybe one picture. <laughs> thank you very much. Guys. Okay, I think that's it, right? Yes. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you for joining us. I still keep talking a little bit about orga items, right? So I just want to say before we start about talking about the evening. I just want to say goodbye to our online participant. It was great having you here with us, kind of. So, and for all live participants, we know it's the official end of the conference day, but it's not the end of the networking. Um, sorry. And we're really look, looking forward to our last evening. Uh, everybody knows, I think, what the last evening of Dairy Conference is. It's the farewell party. And we will go by bus. Less than an hour, a little bit out. Two buses leaving. Closing. Thank you very much, guys.